Thank you. Welcome to this meeting of the Children and Young People Scrutiny Committee. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Heritage Council website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Heritage Council YouTube channel and also making a recording. The recording will be available by the Council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded. Other attendees are permitted to film, photograph, and record our public meeting, providing that it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If you do not wish to be filmed or photographed, please identify yourself so anyone who intends to record the meeting can be made aware. Look one person. Thank you. To ensure the recording quality is maintained, could members speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum and ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silence. Welcome again, Ted. We have some members of the committee joining us remotely today. I will ask them to confirm that they can hear and hear us and check that we can hear them. Councillor the Pace. Can you hear and see us, Tony? Oh, apologies. I was using my space bar, which obviously isn't working. I can see and hear you. Thanks. Thank you. I also see we've got Councillor Andrews. Can you know, can you? Do you see us okay, Councillor Andrews? I can see, I can hear you. Very crackly, but I can hear you okay. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we have our clerk, um, Steve Tucker, remotely, oh. suffering still from COVID, says, wish you a full recovery team, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Can you hear and see us okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. We have someone on Democratic Services whose name I can't see. Uh, that's me, sir. That, that. <laughs> You're the administrator. Okay, that would explain why. And I see you've got Hillary as well. Can you hear me, see us, Hillary? Can I see you? Yes. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Oh, excellent. Um, I can I can hear you. You're you're slightly muffled, but I can hear you well in there, thanks. All right, I think I'm turning away from the microphone ah, to see you. That's right. That's much better, yes. <laughs> Great. Is anybody else online that I haven't mentioned? Uh, it's just me, folks. It's Kerry Morgan. I can see and hear you, folks. Thank you. Okay, Kerry, thank you for that. We have in the room uh, Elisa Arthi. Welcome, Elisa. We'll come to you for later in the agenda, won't we? And we have Phil Brilling on. Tess Burgess, London, Pennsylvania. Northern Line. And Hillary, you're And we have Michael Carr, who's standing in as our clerk for Steve, helping to make sure we capture it correctly. And we have Steve, Steve is on. I'm going to see what I'm yeah. And we have Michaela at the end there, making sure we say and do the right thing. Thank you, Michaela. Have I missed anybody? Yes, Councillor here, we just said we don't know all your jobs, but when it comes to your session, I think that's the come pretty clear who you are and do a brief introduction of yourselves and present. We have apologies from uh, Daryl Freeman, uh, who's the director of Children and Young People. If you know, we have an office in the spectrum at the moment, so he may come to the account that he's been quite demand elsewhere, as you quite imagine. We've had apologies too from uh, Councillor Janet Tomboy, the lead member, and I think Councillor the apologies is that correct, Steve? Sorry, Chair, I didn't, didn't catch that. I think those are all the apologies that we've had. Uh, Andy James, the um, parent governor. Well, Andy James, yes, of course, yeah. And also the leader, David Hitchin, essentially, apologies that he from the same for some of the reasons. Can you cover everybody? Nobody on this. Okay, thank you, everybody, for that. But we have no name substitute to understand. And we. Um, I have no declaration so far, but members are reminded that they should make any declaration of interest uh, if they're to this meeting. If any council has such a declaration to make, no declaration of interest. 
I took on the agenda with minutes to approve and sign the minutes of the meeting held on 26th of April. <coughs> no matter to be notified, I understand the monitor up at the and then I signed the minutes of the meeting with the crew, please. Could be a proposal and seconder. There's Councillor Payton. Thank you. Now to look sideways to see Tony. You have a question. I, I do. Thank you, um, Chair. I was just wondering about the, the updates from the um, public questions. There were um, going to be updates from Daryl Freeman, and I wondered if those are accessible uh, sort of in the, in the public domain. And also, I wanted to ask if, if we have sight of the guidance um, that, that, that's under discussion as councillors. Yes, I was going to raise the point of the question under the actual tracker that I understand a reply has been given, but we haven't seen a copy of that. Uh, so I was going to, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it now. And it's item 16 on the tracker that refers to those questions. I think that's probably what you're looking at. Uh, the point I was going to make, and I'll make it now, that although it's marked as complete on the action tracker, I think it's playing from the continued questions we're getting on that particular person and that the answer still hasn't been given. So I wish to put a record that item 16 on the tracker would not be complete. And I've made representations to the executive that actually we do need to do more to answer that question, because the questions we've answered are not the ones that have been asked, uh, and we do need to put more work into that. So I've made that clear. So could we put that, please? That we do need to get, first of all, see if you've got what you say, Tony, the answer that went to the person, so we can see that, and we also need to make sure that the answers that are given do actually address the question. Okay. In terms of the guidance, I think that's something we should note that we should be sent a copy of because we don't actually have it. There, there's both a heritage guidance and of course there's national guidance as well. And I don't know how many members of that committee have seen or read it, but it, it is a sensible question and we all do make it sure that we see both of our sense of guidance. So could we record that? I'm sure well, I'm sure they can't now record that as an action. Sure Thank that, you. Chair. Okay, yeah. I see we've got somebody else join us, Maria. Can you hear and see us okay, Maria? Yes, sorry, Chair, Did, would you like me to introduce myself? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so Maria Hardy, I'm the lead commissioner with Herefordshire and Worcestershire um, Integrated Care Board and here to um, support the item on the, the SEND and autism. Uh, paper that uh, is being presented. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Do we have a those and second to accept the minutes then with those points made? Yeah. Thank you. Second that Councillor Anson. All those in favour? And it's only councillors that can vote to put us. Unanimous. Thank you. The next is the action log and recommendation tracker. And I already made the point about item 16, we do need to readdress, it's marked as complete, and I regard it's not complete. We need to go back and make sure we address the question. Anybody else want to raise any points about that? Um, hear it. It's not about that, but I'd like some advice from our scrutiny officer here, because looking at the action tracker, we've got Overview, overview, going back 19, 19, to 2021, not complete, overdue. There's so little that's actually been addressed. Now, this is probably what you raised earlier. And, you know, there are some quite serious questions in here. The one that I, I mean, there are lots of them, but the one that I'm sort of very concerned about is somewhere in here, it says it's completed. And then when they, this is the heat map and the report from the participatory officer. Where has that gone? Participatory officer is very relevant to our conversations today, but it's just, I mean, it's deeply shocking to me looking through this. And um, I don't know, I don't know what to say about it and what advice can be given to, because there, there are so many things here that are still relevant. I'm not going to go through them all, but the two of them are there's meant to be a report from the participatory officer. 
And it says clearly that the heat map, which was where looked after children are arising in the county, has been completed. We've never seen it. And we haven't had a report from a participatory officer. And the voice of the child is hardly present in our presentations today. So I'm feeling a bit disappointed. Before we come to answer, can you raise your hand? Yes, I, I, I agree. I agree with, with you, Jenny. Um, and and I mean, number seven, information on the Friends of Leverage to be forwarded to the committee. I raised that last time and said, what was this all about? Nobody knew. And it's still there. Um, One of the problems has been the disruption to the meeting, because obviously the last two meetings were reasonably understood that were cancelled. So we would obviously raise those points maturely in the day when we have. But it's quite clear that points of council are quite true. They're well overdue and they need to be up there. And I propose that we might have to go through them all today. As a matter of urgency, myself, deputy chair, and the officers, we get together. And in addition to reconstructing the actual package, we in the smarter format that I've said, uh, hopefully after today, we'll be getting a couple of recommendations that we'll put in as firm to the executive. And then we'll redo the other tracker that has all these actions that need to be completed and we can go back to the next meeting where we are with them. Would that meet everybody's approval? Fantastic. Yes, and, and also say that offices offices have changed since this they have been, we, yeah. we, we yeah. now have we don't know who the offices are. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know I personally regret the fact that the council the last two meetings and the one was immediately uh, I it's used to the public to have a here one was immediately after the panel on the program the day after and a lot of people, officers and councillors, obviously very upset about things that are happening. And it was felt the next day it might not be an appropriate time for people still recovering from what was said on, on the panorama program would be appropriate to hold the meeting. And the last one, we were going to substantial changes in the way we um, govern scrutiny. There's a lot of work we were planning on all the meetings, which Will result, I'm certain, in vast improvements in the way scrutiny op operates and how we coordinate and how we produce, as we talked earlier, about producing recommendations for the executive. But it did mean that it was a very, very manic several weeks of meetings, and it just wasn't a time for us to produce the reports. So we're also doing the training, and for ourselves, second board all the training. So I was a bit frustrated we had to cancel them. There were good reasons for it, and we did. I mean, need to make up for lost time, but those are the reasons why they were. And of course, things like this haven't had a chance to be brought before this committee for some time. But Phil, I know you had a point you wanted to make. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd, um, yeah I'm Phil Bollingham, I'm the new service director covering quality assurance and performance in children's services. I've, I've been here six weeks now. That was my first meeting, so I'm, I'm pleased to meet you all. Um, and um, my role is to be a dedicated support. Um, Person, uh, lead, lead, uh, lead officer for, for this meeting. So you'll have consistency. I'm a permanent appointment to the service. And so you'll have consistency going forward um, to, to ensure that uh, scrutiny activity is robustly managed. It is, it is, it's quite ironic, really, in some sense, that we've heard from Chair about some of the delays and the reasons why. And, and here we are again with a, a pressing event taking place um, in the service at the moment. And so going forward, uh, I'll argue my commitment that we'll have, we'll have a some, 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 firstly, some priorities to catch up on, which I'll endeavour to, uh, as you said, Chair, to, to, meet, to meet yourselves and uh, to do that, but endeavour to catch up really quickly and, uh, and go forward uh, you know, in a more, more timely manner. I think it's worth noting, we all know that there's an offset inspection going on at the moment, and that officers are very tied up with that. But I have to say, when I query with Steve and Michael and Phil about before I said what I felt we should do about holding this meeting, they were very firm with you, we should despite all the pressures, and that was actually my firm intention anyway, that the officer told me back that, despite the difficulties, obviously, that we have at the moment of news reports, etc. So I can make you know that supporting what the building sector to pull back in the boxes to make sure that we're here doing our job as we should be doing. And thank you all for your support on that. Any other points to raise? Uh, yes, sorry, Councillor Jones. Andrew, sorry. Uh, no worries, Chair, thank you. I would just like to support Jenny in her observation, I think she's spot on again with that, which is nicked one of my items off my list of my preparation, so well done. Um, one of the things I'll add to it, though, is the owners are now out of date. 
So if you look on there, if we can update that with whoever are the current position holders, or actually if that action is still current, and does it need to stay with an action owner or is it redundant action now? So um, if the clerk can have a look at that and uh, make a proposal for the next meeting, I think that'd be very good, please. Yeah, thank you, Graham. I think it's obviously going to be a part of that urgent review of the whole list to make sure we produce a list that is more accurate, including the, the owners. I think it would be appropriate given everybody's concerns and we've got another week for two months that you can see that list as soon as it's produced rather than wait to the next meeting. So you could make any other comments if you wish. So by the time the next meeting, we all agree that is the action list we should be working to. And see you all agree if that makes sense. Okay. Any other comments anybody wanted to make on minutes or an action tracker? Right, let's move on to questions from members of the public. We've had two questions received and we just it to be sadly published. It's a supplementary agenda. We do actually have a supplementary question to one of those from our Co-appears that one. And the Swede, would you like to read out your supplementary question? Um, sorry about this. I thought I had it to hand. Um, I would suggest that perhaps the actual original question and the original responses, mm -hmm. or at least the gist of it, is the original question here. Or perhaps if it could be put on, oh, it's on, it's on the screen, isn't it? Yes, I think it should be, yes. You still want me to um you still want me to read it even though the it's on the screen and also it, it makes more sense if you see the original question and the original response. Do you want to read it or would you like you, to read you read it? it? Yeah. You'd like me to read the supplementary, would you? Yes. Yeah, no. Okay. The original question said what the original question asked, what is the lack that's looked after children rate for statistical neighbours, Shropshire, Devon and Cornwall. Therefore, please would you give me the looked after child rate for these specific counties as at 31st of March 2021. In the looked after performance, looked after child performance report, which was presented at the scrutiny committee meeting on the 1st of June, 2021, looked after children rates were given for Perrybridgeshire and its nearest statistical neighbours, namely Cornwall, 44 per 10,000, Devon, 51 per 10,000, Shropshire, 61 per 10,000, Perrybridgeshire, 88 per 10,000. Please confirm whether or not the statistics in your first response for West Midland, West Midlands, or for West Midlands region rather than West Midlands <coughs> conurbation. As of 31st of March 2021, please advise the average length of time that children and young people have been have spent in the care of Heritage Council. Cornwall Council, Devon Council, Proctor Council, Statistical Neighbour, that's the average, England average, West Midlands region average. Thank you. Let them, you, you had a formal answer to that question. No, that this is a sub, I've had a formal response to the Which, original question, yes. and this is a supplementary to the Which response. And I've been informed that Daryl has promised that he will get an answer after this meeting. Um, Look, she can't come in person, but he's right. I've, has, he, has he given you any time scale? I know he's, I know perhaps after uh, perhaps a week or two because of Austin, but when no, do, when do, do you have any sort of time, uh, idea of when that might be? No, he said a written response will be provided after the meeting. Okay. I'm sure you can understand it's a bit preoccupied at the moment. But yes. I, I would expect that to be, I don't know. I, I wouldn't yeah. that word. So it might be, say, two weeks' time, three weeks' time, something like that. I don't know, but I would say certainly within that time scale would be reason to expect that. Uh, Sorry, doing? Chair, the Constitution says that a written answer to a supplementary will normally be provided with 10 working days from the date of the meeting. So that will be the time frame we're working to. And if for any reason it looks like we're not going to meet that, then we'll keep Fiona informed. Great, thanks for that. Okay, it's really appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. And that would be okay. Um, 
Yes, yeah, Mr. Chair. I said you're happy with that answer. Um, yes, I'm happy to be expecting a question in about two weeks' time. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Chair, do do we as a committee do we get sight of that that response? Do, does it go uh, on the public website, or you know how how do we find out the response to that? Yeah, we should see it, uh, and that goes back to the point that we didn't see the one of the responses to the other question we were talking about, and we should. So I'm sure the clerks noted that. When yeah, it will be it will be published as a supplement to the minutes, Chair. Okay, there you go. That's your confirmation, Tony. Okay with that? Thank you. Great. Any other points about questions from the public? Uh, right, item six on the agenda: questions from members of the council, and no questions have been received. Now, on the next agenda, I think we asked if we can move forward on item nine instead of number seven and eight, and that is obviously children's social care slowly have improvement plan. Phil and Dean, I think, please see you helping with that as well. I'm certainly happy to do that. There's no objection, I'm sure they're not. It doesn't make a difference to anybody else. So over to you to give your presentation to us. Thank you, Chair. Um, for those of you that haven't met me, my name's Lisa Rothy. I'm the Interim Service Director for Improvement. This is a new role. Um, and the main focus of my role is to drive through the improvement plan that I think you've all had a copy of. Um, it was signed off officially at the beginning of June, so it's pretty new um, and will be subject to change very much based on some of the lost dead feedback. So it's, a, it's an ongoing work in progress, but I think it's important that scrutiny members understand that we're working to quite a clear structure around practice and a number of other elements to drive through improvement for the whole of children's services and early help. Um, we did send a presentation through chair. I don't know if that's been loaded. I'm very happy to just do a bit of an overview. Just some overview yeah. that's on the screen. So, so what I've shared here is actually the um, improvement plan uh, outline, which was shared at our improvement board, but was also uh, shared with our staff. And, and unfortunately, due to the Ofsted, a number of the workshops, uh, one particularly today was cancelled, but we are anticipating that as soon as Ofsted has left, we will continue on with that communication out to staff. So obviously I've, I've slightly changed the pitch and the audience, um, but we've kept a lot of the content in because I think it's really important as members that you understand the messages that we're giving out to our staff and our partners as well as, well as yourselves in relation to the new improvement plan. So are, are you happy, Chair, that I just give a brief overview and take any questions at the end? Okay. Yes, please, Chair. Yeah. Are you? Oh, brilliant! Thank you. Okay, that's brilliant. So, um, Lisa, what we particularly want to look at today, as we discussed with Phil, is that um, obviously we want to know the broad outline of, of the improvement plan. But what we agreed with Daryl at our last meeting was that our quarterly reviews of the improvement plan will be specifically around key measures, mm -hmm. and we have a list which we can go to a bit later of sixteen key measures. So, what we'd like to do today is once you give us the overview, is to review the list of the key measures yeah, specifically okay. and agree between us that that is the what we can expect to get from our quarterly return. Yeah. That's what you understood as well. So yeah, no, no, that's right. fine. So I will come on. So we call them measures that matter yes. or, or vital signs. So I think it, it would be important, I, I think, considering uh, the depth of the area that you then get a context to why those measures were, were picked. So. Um, I'll, I'll come on to the measures that matter and, and we can take some individual questions. But yes, you would be expecting update quarter reports in relation to those indicators um, and any other indicators that you, you want information on. So obviously, without going into too much detail, there's a really clear vision uh, in the second version of the improvement plan where we're absolutely committed as a service and I know as a council to all children and young people in Herefordshire feeling safe so that children are actually feeling safe and are safe loved and valued and grow up with the confidence and skills to be the best they can be. So we're not just looking at children coming into the service, uh, you know, the little ease. We're looking at supporting and developing young people throughout uh, to be able to get financial independence and into adulthood. Uh, we're creating a, a child-centred county where children and young people are at the heart of everything we do. And I think one of the things that you'll see through the improvement plan uh, and the consistent change of culture that we're, we're leading now in, in the uh, service directors and, and the corporate director 
is a change of culture around looking at all of our systems and our processes and our forms and everything that we do and really working with our staff to look at what is actually the, in the best interest of the children and people that we're working with. So what we found in some of our diagnostic reviews uh, and certainly continuing uh, to see within the Ofsted feedback is that a lot of our systems have been geared up for adults and for staff and for people uh, to suit us and to suit our partners. And actually what we need to do is start to make a shift that we are actually looking at everything that we're doing is actually in for children, it's in children's language, it's with children, it's co-produced with children and parents. And so that is an ongoing theme that, the, that although you may not see completely written down, is an absolute overarching theme that everything that we do is, is around supporting young people uh, through that process. There's nine outcomes in the plan, and I've really shortened them down and did for staff and for managers, really. So they're quite meaty. But overarching is this need to try and get in as early as possible to support children and young people. So not just around the early help and that community response, but also where children are coming into the door of children's social care. We're working really promptly uh, to make sure that children are getting the right service at the right time. So if they need child protection, they're going into child protection. If they need to come into care uh, and need to go into court, then there's no delay in getting them ready into court and making that, uh, that decision with our, with our peers. So that's the very, very clear theme that you'll see throughout the plan. We're also, as I said, trying to build relationships with young people. So you'll see over the next couple of weeks, much more co-production and, and children's voice picked up about advocacy. We're looking at all of those contracts and how we can actually engage young people. So uh, we're getting real, real time feedback. And that's one of the things that our corporate parenting board has been really looking at, having young people on the board. It may be something that scrutiny may want in the future about having young people in and actually engaging with young people and actually getting an understanding of what it's like for them being supported through children's social care. We make a commitment within our plan that we will support parents, parents and carers to make sure that where it's possible and where it's safe to do so, the legislation and certainly the ethos of our improvement plan is that children can remain at home with support. So we'll only take children into care where it's absolutely necessary to do so. And we don't find any family members, kinship, grandparents, extended family that can step in um, through special orders or, or kin what we call kinship care. And I think that's a commitment that is that it runs throughout the Children Act 1989. It's something that um, we're really looking at in trying to build what we call our edge of care offer, family group conferencing, crash bed facilities for children in terms of some sort of family dysfunction over a weekend, really looking at what support we can do through our ECHO team and our, our interventions at a much earlier stage. And what we will want to do and what you will see, and it's interesting that the question is, once children do come into care, how stable are they? Are they in the right home? Hopefully we're not moving children around too much within that system. So we're building capacity in our placements uh, and within our homes and within our foster carers that where we're putting children in, it's a stable environment. So we're not moving children around, around the system. So that's one of the clear outcomes that we're really keen to promote within the improvement plan. We're also making sure that all of our assessments are demonstrating that we are now a very, very diverse county. Uh, we've got a lot of Ukrainian children uh, within the system. We've also got a lot of asylum seekers, as other councils have. So we're making sure that we're not, uh, we're looking at age appropriate assessments. We're making sure that we've got that level of diversity and that we're being what we call cultural competent. So we're offering a lot of staff and development uh, support through training uh, and uh, individual courses and support for staff to make sure that we're aware of not just ages of children but also ethnic background and linguistic issues that have not been previously picked up. One of the things that we're really keen on and we will be driving through the plan is that we're keeping really up-to-date accurate written information. We do have a problem with our system which I'll come on to. We are really looking at where we can tweak we're looking at how we can record better. We're making sure that the, the information that we record is child friendly, but it's also legally, uh, meets legal requirements in terms of some of the information. So we're getting accurate records to make informed decisions for our children. The other outcome is obviously listening to what children actually say and really making sure that one of the things that we do really well is we engage very early with, um, from, our, from a social perspective, we engage really early with our families. 
one of the things that we don't do very well uh, and have been clearly picked up through the plan and through Ofsted engagement is that we're not ending our relationships with children very well. You'll be well cited on the churn of social workers and staff changes and how that impacts on children really needs to be explored within the improvement and an area I feel for scrutiny uh, in terms of that relationship. So we're really working at what we call a beginning with our engagement with our workers and with our children the middle, which is where we really get to build relationships to make a difference for change. And then what we're doing in terms of moving children back, hopefully home and back out into the system in terms of education support uh, and early help support. And we're, we're really working on those endings. We will continue to create a supportive working culture. So that's not just about training and development, which is actually very good in Herefordshire. We have a very detailed and comprehensive learning offer. It's also about making sure that we are critically challenging to each other. We're very open about that. That creates a shared learning culture. Uh, we don't rely on Ofsted to tell us what's going on. We know ourselves, we're using our raw lips uh, and reporting back through scrutiny effectively and openly and transparently on what's actually going on and what we need in order to do what we need to do. We will keep a focus on making a difference to improving outcomes. So as I said to you, the plan is the plan now. Uh, it's constantly being updated and reflected on. We're going to be using some of our Ofsted feedback, which we'll, we'll feedback obviously when that becomes uh, public on some of those key messages. But, but this is the key areas that we will be looking at, at least for the next two years, which is our transformation journey. So you may see some slight changes in some of the actions, but the actual ethos, the outcomes, the vision, that will stay the same. They're absolutely critical. Uh, and that's what we're going to be embedding in practice in the next, uh, next couple of years. Slide screen. These are the measures that matter. Um, or vital signs, this is the language that we're used to. Um, these are the 16 indicators. Some are performance indicators. Some are indicators that we'll pick up through observation and through audit, through management and supervision. Will be about feedback from our young people and our parents and the mechanisms that we have in place to be open and honest about listening to what they're saying and actually are we making a difference looking at our partners and, and seeing and hearing what they're saying about our performance and what we're saying about their performance and working collectively together to deliver. So when we come on to those measures that matter, it's really important that they are measures that matter to us as an organisation, because that's how we demonstrate that we're getting good value for money and that we're actually doing what we need to do to meet our legislative requirements. But the reasons they were picked and the reasons that they were shared with our staff is these are the success factors that allow us to understand this is what's important to children. And at the end of the day, as I've said, this plan is about making a difference for children and young people. So they're the 16 uh, indicators uh, that we will look at, we will measure, you will, you will have access to, we will be continually reporting on and sharing with our staff. Fine. You have a question, please. Oh, okay. Um, so I can't see um, anywhere in there a child's voice. You've got your bullet points. But, uh, and I neither can I see the partners, um, relationship with the partners. Yes, yeah, so they obviously we don't have at the moment a shared dashboard of performance measures we've partnered, but we would be expecting through our business as usual uh, that feedback, because we feedback to each other regularly through our Safe for Children's Partnership, through our shared engagement around corporate parenting. So it may not be an actual vital sign, but that information will already be there and be made accessible to yourself. It's scrutiny certainly accessible to our staff. We, we feed that back. I mean, the reason that I'm raising it is that um, is that it was a key measure for us. Austin to have the voice of the child. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that the, the plan and one of the things that we said to the staff, wasn't it, Phil, is that that's an overarching aim. What we don't want to do is pigeonhole the fact that voice of the child and participation is one of those key outcomes. It is a golden thread. It's an embedded principle that should work through all our improvement work. But we've never had it here on scrutiny for the whole year of this improvement journey. We've never had either of those things. Well, there are Sorry, oh, I just if I could just come in and just Sorry. just to say we've we've um, I'd be happy to brief councillors next time and indeed share a document that we've um uh, with, which we've endorsed as a leadership team recently to uh, uh, invest and deliver a more robust participation offer. So 
Um, we, we have. Yeah, um, we've got a brilliant participation strategy that yeah. we're just now putting into an action plan well, and hopefully getting some resource to. So I think you know, that would be a really for, good place yeah, to start. I've, 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 read, I've, I've been looking across my portfolio and I found some, we didn't have money for it, but I found it. And so we're going to go out to Advert, we're going to get a new team on board soon. Um, and so I'm excited about that. And I think you're right, we should have it as a, a, a Lisa's right to so say it's a golden thread through, through our service, but you will, you will get so a dedicated. I'm just confused because there was a participation officer who was employed mm -hmm. that um, scrutiny chairs fought to have her, have her mm -hmm. contract extended so that she could complete that report. I think mm -hmm. she was Christine. Christine Robinson. Mm -hmm. Christine Robinson. Was that report completed? Yes, it was, yes. So that's the one that you're talking that's about. That's right, yes. And it, and it was going to come to scrutiny. She was going to present it to it was. Yeah, and I anticipate that the we can pre present oh, I can present it to you. I mean, I have it here on my laptop. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so apologies that was that, but I anticipate that's because previous scrutiny sessions were were, 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 were cancelled. It's, it's, it's a key question for us, and we didn't know whether the report would be published. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he said we were just mentioning it, saying we knew she was leaving end of March, and it wasn't going to be time to finish the report. Mm. No, no, it's a very detailed. It. So it is very done. Detailed detailed news. Strategy. We haven't seen it, and it should be an important part of. Yep. The uh, measures that matter that we review. Helen, you have a question. Thank you for that, Yes, thank you. Um, sitting on the corporate parenting board, we are not engaging at the moment. Just like point that out. Nothing is engaging with who? Well, you, 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 you said that we, we are engaging with the corporate parenting board, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, well, see. not at the moment. As Maybe partners. in the future, but as not partners, the moment. You mean as partners, future. Young people sit on the corporate parenting board, though, don't they? And attended with the. Well, the, the corporate parenting member? board is a new board. It's just set up, and at the moment, there are no young members on it. No. Okay. Well, there is plans. They they were coming. They obviously one of the things that we're looking at is how we uh, don't bombard the board with. Mm -hmm. With with, the, with children sitting through a meeting that isn't relevant to them. So one of the things that Debbie Morgan's doing, who, who works around advocacy and participation, is engaging the young people and then bringing that information with some of those young people into that board. That would be a very standard way of you being able to hear from children directly. Yes, yes. Well, well, that has happened in the past, and 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 we know it's very difficult for young young people and the, and the process. That's why that has all changed, and there's mm. good. We're going to do it differently. That's why the corporate parenting board has been set up. Yeah, we know the corporate parenting board is in transition. The original way it's going to be run, we had a big meeting here. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really very successful, so it was turned down to have a few councils sitting regularly. And I think it's better to say we haven't actually seen the output of that. No, I think it's early days, isn't it? I think yeah, the council is saying it's that obviously it's imminently within its new structure. But, um, okay. So Sam Prattley, um, the representative from the Hereford Diocese. Just looking at your vital success signs, um, a lot of that relates to workforce planning and workforce retention. Mm. I didn't get a lot of that in the prior part of the presentation. So I'm interested in, in why that is. Um, I'm also interested to know what the workforce currently looks like mm -hmm. in terms of vacancies and retention. And also how interested you are at working with partners to do much more early help, much more preventative work so that you can see a reduction in caseload. You don't need so many social workers. Feels like we're assuming we're going to continue with the same level of referral and need the same amount of workforce. Mm -hmm. There was nothing at all about prevention, I don't think, in your earlier presentation. So if I can move on, I can break down. Yeah, um, I'm going to say that yeah, question. We'll the question but yeah. sorry to interrupt because I think what you'll see through the work plans. Uh, do you want to move on to the next slide? I think people are well aware of why there's a need for this. Is that okay? Can we... um, sorry, it's my colleague doing it. it next oh, time. sorry. <laughs> I keep looking at you. Yeah, so um, just in answer to your question, because the plan was quite detailed and would be subject to change, I've divided it into six work boards and programmes. We've got project management. As you can see, one of the priorities is workforce development. So... Um, what we've done is we've divided it into work plans, which we will hope in terms of uh, this is a work in progress. Obviously, the plan was only signed off at the end of May, beginning of June. One of the things that's happened, uh, certainly in the last couple of weeks, is that engagement with early help partnerships. We have a, a good council strategy for early help, but what we need to do and what we're busy uh, 
pacey and uh, getting out and ready is a community prevention strategy, which is where that partnership work is absolutely key, as you say, quite rightly in managing demand, but also going back to the right time, first time in terms of people being uh, deterred from needing statutory high risk services. So what you will see through scrutiny and, uh, and, and through that quarterly reporting is these highlight reports where we are breaking down the improvement plan for these key actions through these work programmes. So we've got a, a senior lead that leads all of the programmes and what we're hoping to do in the next couple of weeks is where we're developing within our own service is adding partnerships to that. So corporate parenting, the operational group is multidisciplinary. The early health and partnerships, uh, which is an area that I'm leading at the moment, we've had a number of workshops with early health partners. One of the partners is actually on the call CCG. And what we're looking to do is start visioning that, in, as I said, into a more community based um, arrangement. In terms of service and practice development, well, we need to get our own house in order in terms of our assessments, our plans, our supervision, and some of those indicators. And as soon as we do, and one of the things that Phil's leading on is that child safer partnership training development. So where we're offering training on some key aspects of child protection, we can share that with our partners. Exploitation, again, key area that needs to be developed through the partnership. Can you just, sorry, whoever's moving the slide, can I just start? So what I've done in the slides and obviously open to any questions is just give a very, very brief overview of the detailed work that's going on in these work programmes, which scrutiny will obviously be subject to having a look at. We do know the numbers, but I don't have the figures. I can send them obviously to, to the chair afterwards in the terms of what we've got in terms of staff vacancies, what we're going to be looking at in terms of some of the agency teams that we've had to build some of that demand and what we will be doing uh, and we will be reporting back to our resource board in October is what our actual establishment will look like based on that reducing need. Because as you know, we brought in a number of teams skilled uh, to meet some of that early capacity and our referral rate, uh, and Phil's got the, the data next, is, is starting to drop which means that we are effectively moving children uh, through the system. So if we build our early help offer, which is one of our work programmes, we will be able to successfully reduce our referrals. Um, and only those children that are needing really high level child protection support or, or needing to come into care will, will come through that door. So I've just gone through the work programmes. Uh, we've now got a dedicated HR lead. Recruitment is one of our key areas. We can't do a lot of our change unless we have a permanent workforce. So we're doing an awful lot within our work programme, not only to understand uh, what we have, but also to make sure that we've got the right skilled, capable staff. Um, there's a lot of talk about social work recruitment. Of course, it's huge uh, in terms of really low uh, numbers across the UK. But what we need to do is start to think about do where we need social workers and where we need other disciplines, uh, where we need health, where we need detached workers, where we need uh, trained staff around some therapeutic intervention, not only for our looked after children, but for some of our edge of care offer. So that whole piece of work is being done uh, within that work programme. Happy to take any questions on workforce, Chair, or would you like me to move through? Thank you, Lisa. I think we'll get Chair as first of all, Sam. Just a follow up point. Um, sometimes other agencies and organisations are better able to recruit local people who know the families and people we're working with and care a lot, but they don't necessarily have the professional threshold that mm -hmm. is required to work for local authority or don't want to work for local authority. Mm -hmm. Hence my point about how creative are we willing to be mm. about enabling other organisations or agencies to do a little bit more of the work, accepting where there's a statutory responsibility. Mm. Do you think that could be something? I think, I, think we're, I think we're going to be as innovative as we need to be. I mean, my, in my experience, I've brought in the community and voluntary sector to sit within the statutory field. Uh, I think one of the things that we'll come on to is the commissioning of, of those agencies, hugely uh, you know, need to draw out some of that community and huge expertise within that community and voluntary sector. And it was really quite heartening in the early health workshop that I had a couple of weeks ago that they were well represented and very able and very willing. And I think one of the things about having a strategic board and also a strategy is that everybody's clear about what the vision is and what needs to be done. So I, I don't think anything's off the table um, because that is absolutely key in terms of making sure that people are 
uh, supported at the earliest opportunity. And as you say, we only use our social workers and our highly skilled staff to do that really highly skilled work. Um, and I think I think you're right. I think that that's definitely something that we're looking at within the commissioning field. Um, we haven't got any arrangements at the moment with the NSPCC or Children's Society, and 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 we need to do that. Hence the reason why um, we're looking at the skill base, not just the qualification at this point. To answer your question, okay? So, that's okay. Thank you. So, as I say, I'm just, just going to whiz through some of these reports so that you'll be aware, uh, and, and in case you need any other detail, that the highlight reports of these boards and the progress and outcomes that they're making in relation to improvement will be open, open to yourselves for scrutiny. We'll Next sure slide, please. Are, please. Yes, we'll make sure they are. Oh, so you had a question from Councillor Jones. Um, yeah. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I welcome the improvement plan. Um, I hope it's just not a document that's just been written to just, you know, to tick boxes. Tick a box. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because some of the things that I hear on there were, were talked about. I, I presume the um, the problem with the updating the IT systems is going back to this mosaic system, which we talked about two or three years ago, which was inadequate. And it, you know, it's only being looked at now, maybe. I presume that's mm -hmm. that's um, if you've been that data on that. And um, Catherine Knowles, the ex interim director of children's services, talked about the voice of the child that many times, and we still haven't heard about the voice of the child. Mm -hmm. But um, and the other thing is culture it takes a long time to change the culture of the council and its staff and its services. And um, I just, you know, just do you think it makes a difference? Because I noticed the, uh, the 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 director of children's services is not here today. But does it make a difference that when you know that head or isn't absent from uh, meetings? And I know we can't be everywhere, but um, I think to me that's part of changing the culture. Yeah, because totally. people people staff do. When the boss is in, he's in, but he's obviously drowning yeah. in Austin. So yeah, I'll let him wanna, come down yeah. and have a conversation with you. So, yeah. I mean, it's not that he doesn't want to be here. I think one of the key things, uh, and you'll see the feedback when you have a look at the Austin when it becomes public, is the visibility of the new leadership team. Um, you know, and having worked in a number of places, even through COVID, I think that there's been a real move in terms of getting visibility and getting staff back into the office to engage that. I think one of the things about the plan when I came in at the end of May is you're right, it can't just be a document that sits in a drawer and every case often we just get the dust off it like something out of Harry Potter. These work plans are going to be multi-agency. We went out to workshops, we got inundated with the staff wanting to be part of the retention work, wanting to get involved with the foster care recruitment. Really fantastic ideas. I mean, you know, even in the years that I've been here, there's some really great things that we need to do, but it's just how you capture that one of the things about the plan and one of the things that I know you'll pick up in scrutiny is you can't do it all at once it's an absolutely huge whole service change and you're, you're right culture is the last thing to change but with a clear vision with a clear plan that's measured with investment that the council is now committed to which is brilliant you will start to see that change but what you need to do and and, and what we need to do as a leadership team is make sure that's incremental otherwise it won't be sustainable uh, and I think that's one of the things that you as a panel really need to understand is that is, is that sustainability, isn't it? So that it isn't just, you know, a plan that rolls out every year without any effect. If I could just, um, I was going to go on to early help, but I, mean, I feel like... have a few more slides to present. Well, I was just going to show my learning colleague the, um, the there is a systems QA work programme. Um, which actually Phil is leading in terms of QA. And what you'll see on the slide and certainly what you'll see on the plan is there will be further tweaks and further changes to Mosaic and, and some further investigation about whether this system is actually fit for purpose. But you'll appreciate that changing a whole data system with over 5,000 names, numbers and, and children details is going to be a longer process. So what we need to do is have a short-term plan to build in you know what we need now and then maybe think about what we're going to need in the future but scrutiny members will be part of that conversation 
uh, uh, can somebody see you had your hand up? Uh, you have to wait to end the presentation, or you like to ask it now? No, I'd like to ask it now, really, because I think Lisa's probably hit the, the right opportunity for us the question. Yeah. Is, okay. Several people have asked about, you know, what we're going to do first, what we're going to do second. I, I like what you put together as the improvement plan. I think it reads really well. I think there's lots of good dates and things within it. The one thing that's missing for me is a prioritization matrix of what you're there, what you're going to do here and there. So as you just said just now, the culture changes last. I'd probably challenge that. There's having changed cultures before and you try to change them all the way through. But within what I'm looking from you is to see from this improvement plan, what are your quick wins? What are the things that you want to come back to the scrutiny committee and say, this is a high success factor and it's difficult to do. How can I make it achievable to happen? So I can tell by the words you're using, you're an experienced improvement manager. So you know what I'm talking about. But I'd like to see how that develops into your improvement plan. And then you come back to us with those difficult conversations of saying, I'd like to improve this. It's hard to do. Can you help me do it? Yeah, am I happy to just Any comment on that? I think that's a fair point. I think that's one of the things that we're doing within the work programmes. And certainly what we wanted to do was go out to staff to, uh, as I say, not bombard them with lots of actions, but to come up with some key priorities. The priority, and I'm sorry if it isn't clear, we would obviously take that back in terms of feedback, is that children are safe. Uh, and that we know that children are safe. The second issue is, is we can't move forward as a service if we don't have the right skilled, the right permanent capable workforce. So recruitment is obviously up there, hence the reason for the workforce development need and that engagement with corporate services. And then obviously the other issues are about reducing demand, making sure that we've got the right children in, in the right place in the service. We don't want children that don't necessarily need a social worker when they need a lower uh, different skilled worker and stuff so we do have a priority matrix and we are very happy to share it but at the moment we're we're still storming and norming within the work programs if I'm honest and we wanted to really make sure that staff were aware of those prioritizations so yeah. um, very happy to sort of give give a follow-up on that but as I say the workshops haven't all completed because Ofsted took us slightly off of our our timetable, which is ironic, isn't it, when you're trying to improve service and Ofsted are inspecting you. Two more questions. Cancer, do it first. I, uh, well, can I come, back, can I come back on that, Chair? Oh, sorry. Yeah, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. brilliant. I, I mean, I, you chucked in the priority being the vision, which I, I took that as granted, to be honest, about children being safe. But um, yeah. that's, that's fine. The bits of, I think that priority matrix is really key for me to see that. Otherwise, as um, as Mike said, you, you just a lot. It, it could be seen as a lot of words, and I don't want you to be seen as putting up an improvement plan that is just a lot of words. If I was able to see that what your prioritization is, is it the recruitment of the people first? Is it changing some of the structures, the tools that you're working with? And we could see what they are in that in a, a simple matrix. It doesn't have to be massive, but just tells you where where we're going to be. I think that, that would get you a lot more sort of respect of what you're doing. That build on what you have put together which is an excellent document. I, I say it's very good, but um, I, 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 I'm going to continue to push you like I do with all these meetings. Is it needs to be quicker? Ofsted do arrive. We're lucky that's how it is. We, we all have those problems in every field of work that we do, and we have to get over those hurdles. But I'm, I'm really encouraging you to take it on that. You come forward and say these are our quick wins. These are our huge successes. And this is where we could have huge success, but it's difficult. And saying, come and help us, what can we do? And, and, and push scrutiny to help you better and find the right answers. But I think you're in a good position, but please don't make it wordy. Yeah, I absolutely endorse what Kim Jango is saying about right from the start of this iteration of scrutiny, we've always said, we look forward to you actually saying, these are the things that challenge us. Can you yes. scrutinise those? And I think that has been something that's been particularly worked two way before. That officers feel that they can come to school and say, look, these are the areas that we're really struggling with. And uh, that's where you can help. So because of that conversation, we're going to form a task of finish group to look at workforce retention, for example. But more coordination and cooperation both ways is something we would certainly welcome. The councillor here will be a question. Sorry, but people want to ask questions as you go along. So are you going to go back to the beginning of your presentation? And you said you're going to have um, family-friendly language. 
you can look at um, the link that's on, on the website, please, and um, that's send advice for families. It's the one for professionals and for policymakers. There's a wonderful send government advice that's family friendly. Put that on there. So that's a recommendation. <coughs> Um, obviously, this committee have, are really keen to see you actually endorsing the fact that you need the voice of the child and the participation of children in here. But one of the things that I would note about this program, and, the, and it doesn't scream it at me, and, and the reason I'm saying it is that I met with a lot of parents yesterday who were out here, many of whom have been in very difficult situations and whose children have um, are waiting for statements or who have statements of you know um, of, of send and children what what I can't get over is that we've had all this money and for a critical situation and that so much money has gone into management where we didn't say women and children first let's get them out of there let's lift them out of that situation. And what's and it's in our reports from the officer who gave us the send report. He says buy-in from senior managers. That one of the critical areas is buy-in to that area from senior managers. So I'm going to push you really hard on this because I think it's really important that when you have risk to an authority, where children, you you look at the least come first. Those who are at most risk are actually brought to the fore of the program. And I'm sure that's what you're trying to do. But when you read in an officer report that buy-in from senior managers is, you know, is what's needed, then, you know, I'm looking to see that. I'm looking to see that that's what will happen. And then this is me being really... You're making a point. <laughs> no, I, I think you make a valid point, but you're referencing SEND, and I know that that's the next item, but I mean, I think, as I've said, you know, we do need to get better and we are getting better. We can't just rely on people like Christine to present a report and not actually make sure that every single social worker and every single early health worker is engaging with families. One of the models that we're looking at is, is participation champions, so that you've got those champions within the service. Until you can manage the demand and the caseloads, no social worker, uh, even an absolutely brilliant social worker, can actually do the job effectively. That's well documented. No social worker at the moment doesn't want to spend more time with children and actually engaging that need for change. So the management of demand that your colleagues raise is an absolute valid point. These work programmes are absolutely focused on making sure that children are absolute centre. But the other infrastructure that the, the, the improvement plan obviously details and has to detail, you know, is collective corporate responsibilities and stuff, which, which we really need to harness to be able to do that. So I think Councillor Hugh, you may Thank you. Do you, you have a whole Do you want me to go through the rest of the work? Programs. Well, I, I asked how I was under 10, you can do that, and then I'll come you, back. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just mindful that I may answer some of your queries in terms no, of whether you haven't seen the presentation in advance. Okay. So we're happy to carry on. Okay. So I mentioned early help, a huge area of work and, and a huge commitment from partnerships. And certainly, as I've said, the workshops and, and the strategy will be ready in draft, and it may be something that you want to come back in September. So there's lots of commitment there, looking at assessments, looking at clear pathways, looking at engagement of schools there's some really great stuff happening in our schools we just need to harness it to make sure that we're seeing the right children and that that information sharing and communication between us and our statutory services is improved that's one of the areas the other key area is exploitation very little offer in Herefordshire given the depth and, and the rurality of, of, of the of the county so we have an exploitation service we're making steps at the moment with our corporate colleagues to ensure that that offer is is much more robust. We're looking at domestic abuse and neglect. So there are areas that you, you may want to come back and obviously spend a little bit more time in, in detail with. Next slide. Resourcing commissioning, I've, I've mentioned, we do need to make sure that we've got the right homes in the right places. We have too many children outside of Herefordshire because we don't have the resources in. So we're doing a lot of work around building partnerships with markets. You'll be aware of Josh McAllister's National Social Care Review that urges councils to come together to block purchase and to really work collectively to make sure that we've got 
the right residential homes for children that, that, that need it, that we are looking at uh, recruiting more foster carers, we're just in uh, conversations with that whole social media presence. We're looking at making sure that we're building that relationship with providers. There is an awful lot of, of, of children's homes in Herefordshire that we don't use as a council. So it's about good business and how we kind of do that. So there's a lot of work being done there. And one of the things that you just uh, said, which really touched me, Councillor Stewart, is we need children to be inspecting those homes and engaging those social workers. And where I come from is they phone up and ask their their children, their other children, how did your IRO get on and how, you know, did they do that? So we're really needing to build that in terms of resource and commissioning. Next slide. One of the other areas which feels leading in terms of improvement is exactly as your, my colleague has just said in relation to Mosaic. So we're doing an end to end review. We're looking at the right system. We need to make sure the system and the managers are actually embedded together. So what we're looking at is can we have more support on the ground so that managers input what we need to pull through so that you as a scrutiny get accurate data. It isn't just about audit and it isn't just about data. They're obviously important, but it's about observation and it's about making sure that quality assurance is, is a proper system. Um, and we also need to think about practice framework. So you'll hear this a lot in the next couple of months. We have a science of safety practice framework. What we'd like to do is think more about trauma, trauma-informed practice, how we're actually going to engage with that. It's a huge model. Um, trauma-informed trained myself, so I feel hugely passionate about, about that. We're looking at what other practice frameworks. That gives a sense of identity to the people that work in Herefordshire. So as soon as you walk through the door in Herefordshire, this is the way that we work. This is the expectation of how we work with our parents and our children and our partners. So again, that system, uh, that work board is actually looking at what systems and practices necessary. Uh, and that's the work in progress. And lastly, I think I've just referenced the corporate parenting uh, operational group, which, which colleagues will be aware of, obviously feeds into that corporate parenting board. Um, and this one is about service and practice. And this one is where we really need to start investing in some real detailed analysis. So we know that there's some real fundamental issues with the practice within Herefordshire that we've picked up as a, as a senior leadership team. And we need to get much, much better at the quality of assessments and the quality of plans. And we're going to be doing a lot of work with our service once Ofsted has left based on their feedback on making sure that everybody in the organisation understands what good looks like. Uh, and that supervision is in place, that we're looking at the skill audit, that we're making sure that we've got the right support for staff in the right places. So have we got the right managers? Have we got the right structures uh, in order to take this service forward? Because like I say, this plan needs to be about sustainability. You don't want to come back in a year and say, oh, here we are again and we haven't made any progress. So I've got now eight practice development leads that sit within my um, improvement team. They are out in the teams. They are working alongside the social workers and managers to really start to develop that quality of practice that you expect to see and our children expect to see, which unfortunately has been lacking in, in quite a lot of significant areas in Herefordshire and has been highlighted in, in a number of inquiries uh, and media attention. So you will see, and I would expect you to criticise quite heavily and scrutinise quite heavily, that service and practice plan to make sure that you're, you know, we're getting what we need to get in terms of the right support for children at the right time. Just lastly, I think I've just referenced about why this is important. I'm, I'm not going to egg, egg the pudding, but what we really need to do is make sure that we are uh, moving through at pace, and you're right, raising challenges and issues and barriers, which are as much in the council as outside of the council, uh, and making sure that we're using our corporate partners in an effective way and using our statutory partners and our, our, our leadership. And I've just listed some of the progress that we've made within a very short space of time. Phil and I have only been with the council six, seven weeks, but we have got a good corporate HR lead now. We have started the business support regrade and local recruitment. We will be going out to tender on a whole significant number of recruitment in September. I've mentioned the practice development leads. If the slide is moved, I'd be appreciative. There is a skill audit that's being underdone in terms of our career progression. 
we are looking at our preventative strategy. We are on target to deliver that in draft for, for September. And we are now looking at the local government uh, association who did a very, very detailed diagnostic in relation to our corporate parenting board. And I know Daryl would say if he was here that he's done some significant member training on some of that corporate parenting and would be very happy uh, to do further member training and further support to corporate colleagues around the role of, of children's services, but also the role of being a corporate parent. We know we can do a lot more within that area. I hope that's it was a very whistle stop, uh, and I'm sure you'll hear much more, but just very, very. We've got a few questions. Thank you, exactly. yes. yes. Answer Stan. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned schools a bit earlier in your presentation. I just wondered what um, links you're building up with schools across Herefordshire, because it seems to be absolutely vital in implementing this plan. And of course, over the last two years, the schools, some schools have been not totally closed, but semi-closed quite a lot of the time. So children have been listened to even less during the pandemic. There must be a great deal of catching up to do. Um, there have been a great deal of problems mentioned in the press about children's mental health mm. and the effects of the um, pandemic and disruption to schooling. So I think all this ties in. It just adds to your workload, I know, but I think the schools will know a lot of these children much better than anyone else, but mm. their families, of course. And so linking with the schools, I think, is vitally important. Um, and I'm surprised when you mentioned schools have been passing towards the end of your presentation, as I thought they would be very much the centre. Thank you. Chair, am I happy to respond? Of course, yes. So, yeah, I mean, obviously that's where all our children are, or, or we expect them to be. We know that school is a huge resilient factor and, and, and that. So there is, there's obviously very good engagement with schools and they were at the early help workshop. They, they, you know, and we do have them on our improvement board, which is, as you know, chaired by the DfE. So there is a constant engagement. In terms of corporate parenting responsibilities, we work effectively within our own school, school unit, but there's always, we, we could do more. And I think one of the things around the early help strategy Strategy is that having that sort of clear commonality is that we'll be able to map what we've got and, and what we need going forward and I think that's one of the things that we need to do. Uh, mental health obviously we have a government directive to have mental health workers within every school but we know that that needs to be a lot more and uh, we also know that CAMS isn't, isn't the answer for every young person so what we need to do within that early help strategy with our schools and with our education colleagues in the council is make sure that we're having a bit more of a what we call a pathway so that we've got counselling at different levels we've got support and mental health at different levels so there is engagement with schools it could be better one of the things that we'll be desperate to do once uh, we've, you know, they're back in September is go out to the schools with the improvement plan, get as much school representative and educational representative on these work programmes where, where we've got capacity and they've got capacity to do that. But you're right, that there, there does need to be good, good substantive links. And I think that's why that role of DCS is hugely important because that education and social care sits under one leadership. This also includes all the academies, I hope. Yes, of course, yes. When I talk to schools, I talk all educational establishments, including STND and, and any residential. Thank you. Yes. Committee members are lining up to ask you questions. Oh, okay. If there's any patient until you finish, uh, <laughs> you to ask you Yeah, questions. thank you yes. for the presentation, and I'm going to wait until we see it at the end of it. I did like the, you know, I've been very impressed by lots of improvement plans in terms of vision and values, and less impressed in terms of impact, we are a scrutiny committee and that sort of thing got to say. But in fact, it was, it, was, it was a good presentation. I particularly like what you said towards the end, which was that what, if people understand what good looks like, because I think that's absolutely crucial to your of key course. performance indicators. And that is, a, for me, is a key point of any good improvement plan, because if you know what good looks like, then you can put in what the obstacle to success might be. But I do feel that colleagues often need training mm. to be honest and and then review it on a regular basis mm. to what the obstacle to the success of your what was your six areas <laughs> i think that's crucially important for, for to move forward i also like the point where you said you were data rich but analysis poor and i think one of the things about embracing ofsted and, and as a, a previous head teacher who went through eight ofsteds i am well aware <laughs> and I don't ask how many hmi visits i had but basically the thing about Ofsted, and I think it's, is if it assists genuine evaluation 
then it is to be embraced. And I think, you know, the very name Ofsted has, if you said Ofsted, I don't know what people would, the next word would be, you know, but in actual fact, if it's helping you to analyze your data, I think you've got to use this opportunity of Ofsted coming in mm. to really move your plan forward. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see next time what they find mm. whether the pair of eyes always useful and how you can incorporate that into this in, this plan mm. one thing that did worry me in that when we had a previous uh, uh, presentation there was a lot of uh, a lot of talk about april about recruitment and retention it'd been mentioned already this afternoon and you started off with you're in an interim post mm. and for me if you want good leadership then you need to have you know over a period of time because things do change and that's good but you do need to have if you are in a situation where there are things that are clearly not as they should be uh, that may well be seen as an understatement but it is a, a fact that, that having too many people in interim posts seems to be one of the main problems that we are where we are mm -hmm. and you know and, and and as someone who's new to the committee that has been mentioned by people with a lot more experience than me. But I think that, that you know, on these committees. But I think as a scrutiny committee, that's the one thing that stands out in the, the number of interim people and therefore the effect that has on continuity and consistency. And let's get it right back to the child. That is, if, if there's a golden thread, this is a terrible thread going through not only within the management, but also within the, within the care for the, for the individual child. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, but I would like to thank you for, for, you know, for what you seem to have done, a very, a very professional job in a very short period of time. Thank you. I don't think that needs any more response. You made your points. No, I just want to make No, I, I think it's, I think it's a valid point. Sorry. That's all right. Cool. I, I think it's a valid point, and I think it's one that we didn't have to wait for us to, to, to let us know. It has been very much stop start. We do have now a senior leadership team that is um, permanent uh, with Phil, and I'm sure your meet Rachel Gillett has also started as permanent service director for promote all of the frontline teams. I think the reason that this is fixed term is that um, obviously improvement can go either way. And obviously what you would hope for over a period of time is that the service directors would encompass that within their role. But given the depth of improvement that we need in order to get this service up and running and safer than what it is, I think I'm, I'm, this role is considered as additional capacity, but it will be consistently looked at as we go forward. And, and you're right, Ofsted are... Uh, they hold up a mirror to what we are actually you know, doing, so there will be further changes to our improvement plan, but certainly to our prioritisation of work based on a lot of the initial findings of Ofsted. Um, because, as I said, the practice is, is of concern and we, we, need, we, will be, we are drilling down on some of that, given some of that findings already. We're not waiting for Ofsted to write anything or tell us anything. We're, we're doing it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Two more. Hands have been up. Uh, Councillor Fagan and then Councillor Anson. Uh, thank you. Um, Chair, and, and also th thank you to everybody who's been involved in producing this, this work. And there's obvious there's a, a huge amount of thought and consideration that's gone into it. Um, I think that the whole issue of changing culture is something we have to sort of take on board across the whole of our society. And uh, that, you know, that idea that we put children kind of at the center of everything we do, not just at the center of the kind of uh, sort of improvement plan but um, the, the the thought um, you, you were talking about sort of other disciplines working alongside um, which is really really important that whole partnership working is absolutely crucial because that's the only way we're going to embed all these changes sort of th throughout the whole life of a child um, you know the the idea that it takes a community to raise a child I think is actually really important um, so schools are key and uh, obviously that's been discussed pastoral care what I'm sort of wondering is that if the for if school forums are able to sort of feed into the I'm not sure what the acronym the CIC is um so just but, but uh, if it 
if if they could, um, you know, school forums could sort of feed into that more uh, sort of centralized voice of children in the county, that would be helpful. So I've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, one is about the um, the IT sort of the network capacity to actually deal with um, or all of the additional work that's going on. Are, are we sure that we, the, um, we, we're being provided with a, a service that can actually accommodate all of that? That's one question. Um, the other one is about ref refugee families. And now I know that there is an assumption, for example, amongst the Afghan families that, oh, they speak English and um, the case is actually that most of the those families in particular, I'm just using them as an example, don't actually speak English. And they, you know, there's a huge amount of trauma and need that's coming through those refugee families that are settling in Herefordshire. So uh, the question really is, you know, do, do we have enough crossover with the support for refugee families to actually support these families through, through the trauma and the obviously the children are going to be sort of at the cold front of that. Uh, and the, the final question is about kinship care. And again, it comes back to that whole thing of communities supporting um, uh, supporting families when things go wrong. And I have heard nationally that there is a, uh, there are huge issues with people, um, the, the financing of kinship care and that actually families are not actually able to, um, sort of properly resource looking after children in the same way that foster carers could. And, and I wondered if this is an issue in, in Herefordshire and is there something that we can do sort of locally uh, to, to address this so that we can actually give better support to families trying to look after children who are, are falling sort of through the gaps in their own sort of family constellation. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, um, in terms of the IT systems, um, obviously it's very slow. And we're not going to lie. We know Mosaic has huge, huge issues for us. We're just working with the system as it is, um, and it's going to be constantly up updated and, and reviewed. And as I said, we are going to be looking at whether we can uh, accelerate a, a different system uh, and a different contract. So, in terms of the network now, it's just about holding its own. Um, I think that's, that's all I can say in relation to that. I'm not an IT expert, but um, it's like all systems, really. None of them are completely uh, fit for purpose, but we're working with what we've got, aren't we? Yeah, I, 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 I can probably just uh, talk a bit of detail. So um, the Mosaic system can be complemented with some practice guidance forms. So they're forms that practitioners complete in parallel to guidance as you go through the process and that enhances outcomes and keeps central um, the child's voice and their journey. And so um, we've got a 12-month um, programme to implement that now. We've just actually had to sort out some licence issues. We've done that now. So we're, we're really pushing on with that now. So we're, um, we're, that, that's part of a, a programme that, um, that I'm leading and that we're working on as rapidly as we can. So I'll keep members updated on that as we as we keep develop, develop, developing it. We're also looking to tweak Mosaic so that it's um, it's more prescriptive because at the moment there's there's too much flexibility in the system. So then you don't necessarily get the right the measurement, the, the data outputs that you want to see. So that's some, some of the, the kind of key lines of focus that we're looking on for our, to develop the system. So I'll, uh, I'll keep members updated on that. As Two more goodbye. questions then. I think we need to see if we can draw some conclusions out of the debate. Kerry, you were, oh, Helen, Sorry, do you, you want me to finish off my response to a colleague on, on the call? So sorry. just in terms of refugee families... Oh, sorry, do, sorry, yes, of course. Yeah, yes. we do have a, a really robust offer, which is actually led within our, our commissioning and resources service. We only deal with Afghan and all asylum seeking or any families in transition if they meet our criteria for statutory services. So a lot of our work is about working with schools, uh, which I'm sure Kerry can comment on in terms of trying to... Uh, get children settled and supported regardless of where they where they come from and how they end up within our area. So there is an awful lot of support and we do get um, quite a significant amount of central government funding to do that. But we only deal with families if, as we would with all families if they, if they meet that statutory uh, requirement. And in terms of kinship care, you're right, there is a national review at the moment going on about 
what we would call matching the funding of fostering to kinship care. For us in Herefordshire, we know that we can do more around kinship care. We do have a high number of children that are placed with family members and we are reviewing our financial offer at the moment in terms of what we call special guardianship or child arrangement orders, which are the two orders where uh, families can have financial support package, which is means tested or, um, and ongoing support can be offered as an alternative to foster care. So we are looking at that as all as all councils are within the Josh McAllister's uh, social care review that you reference. So we can update as, as we do that nationally. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just a few minor points. I, I mean, I was speaking to our rector who has a very close relationship with, with some uh, a couple who were social workers, and they were very distressed at the time of the, the judgment. Um, and um, and then things were better, apparently. But he says that they are now in a state where they are more stressed than they have ever been, which is really, really worrying. Um, but I, I sort of I jotted things down. But uh, just can you, um, there's some worrying news about Ukraine, U Ukraine, Ukrainian families who've been nationally who've been placed in in have had placements and they haven't worked out and they're and they're you know they've had to leave. Is this happening in Herefordshire? Do we have any evidence of that? I mean, hopefully not, but but it would be quite good to know the the the, the details of it. And, and then just one minor thing. Spring last year, I did um, drawings for, it was um, a leaflet. Who can make decisions about your leaflet? And it was with, um, done by the Children's Social Work Manager, Children, Young People in Care Team. And she was Vicky Leader. I don't know if she's here anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I did these drawings. Has anything happened to that leaflet? Um, and because it, it just made me think about it because um, um, the graphics on this, I'm, I don't, they're not my fave. Um, and, and having done work quite hard on those drawings, they've just disappeared into the. Into the um, yeah, I think those are good points, but they're not directly related to Kruma kind of work. Okay? You can obviously get answers to that. If you think they are related to recruitment, can then you can comment, but I think otherwise we... Yeah, I mean, they're just, just graphics for, for staff to try and make it as child-focused as okay. possible. But um, in relation to the leaflets, I can take that offline and get yeah. the leader to, to send that. Yeah. She's still here, is she? Yes, she's the service manager for early help. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kelly, you've had your hand up for a while. You are comment yeah thank you chair i'll be brief because i'm conscious of time chair but just wanted to pick up on a couple of the comments that various councillors have made in relation to the interface between schools and social care um lisa's quite right there is quite a strong interface already it could be better would be my view but there are three head teachers on the improvement board which is one one kind of kind of normal way of ru routinely um having contact we do actually have um the schools forum have a standing agenda item. There's two sorts of school forums, really. There is the schools forum itself, and then there's a budget working group, but they often talk about the same agenda items, and they have a kind of social care interface agenda item now, which they didn't have, um, Just to, which is good. On, on Specifically on the refugees, um, both Ukrainian and Afghan refugees, we've got about 350 Ukrainian families or individuals in the council now. That, that number's not exact, it changes, but about that. And about 118 Afghans. And we're looking at simple ways of integrating them more into their community, which is, I think, your point, Councillor Fagan, about it takes the community. And one of the simple ways is we have a little bit of unspent money on laptops. If you remember the laptop scheme during the pandemic, not all of that money was spent because in reality, the schools just went and bought it themselves and then said, that, you know, we'll just take the hit if you like. So we're planning to provide laptops with translation software on for both the Afghan refugees and the Ukrainian families and looking at some more support groups. So they mix with people who have their own language skills, if that makes sense, until they're, until they're better <coughs> supported. Um, but to get back to the point about the pandemic, um, in fairness to Lisa and Phil, they, they probably haven't been here long enough to 
to know that we actually submitted a report to this panel about, I forget now, about six months ago on the impact of the pandemic on the mental health and wellbeing. And we, we said we'd review it again at some point. Um, I'll make sure that they have a copy of that report. It basically was fairly bleak. It basically said some year groups suffered more than others because of their isolation and younger children, particularly, if you remember folks. So I'll make sure that's shared. But to try and build on what's going on between social care and education, we've got a conference lined up on October the 23rd, I think, from memory, um, in the Courtyard Theatre, I think, from memory, which is focused on children's services and the interface with schools. So there's quite a lot of work going on in the background to kind of make that sort of work dovetail more readily, um, which we're looking to build on. Um, so to try and reassure, there's a lot of work going on between Schools Forum and Social Care now. We actually did really well during the pandemic in terms of attendance for children known to social care. I think from memory, we topped the West Midlands Regional attendance charts throughout the entire pandemic. So, you know, there is good work, but could we do more? Yes, we could. And we hope to start that better quality interface. Now we've got the permanent team in place on October the 23rd in with the conference between school leaders and, and Daryl and his team. Thank you, Chair. That's a quick update of some of the stuff we've been doing Thank recently. You, I Thank you, Chair. Keep to move on. I do hang out at Michael. Yes, I want to give us a brief comment. Yeah, yes, well, yes, you first FBI. So I, I just thought I'd uh, briefly just flag as well the part of the improvement plan, page 35 and 4, uh, 73 of the agenda, L5. Uh, members are, act, are able to actively discharge their scrutiny function. So I just thought I'd flag that because that relates specifically to work of the policy. And I'll just make two points there to think about. Uh, one is how focused is the Scrutiny Works program on the improvement plan agenda? Because obviously, ideally, we want to be really focused on that agenda, I would suggest, mm -hmm. and to be able to, to, to work with it, mm -hmm. uh, and including the timing and scope of those items that we're going to be doing for the rest of the year. And also about the planned activities in terms of um, enhancing uh, members' effectiveness in this process. We've got work, workshops and other activities planned here. Just making sure to think about how that is working through the council's governance arrangements and make sure it comes back through this committee, because that's one of the things. There's lots of activities which help members do that. But just being mindful of that, I make that point. Make sure it comes back through this committee so that uh, it's pulled together and is focused on the improvement agenda. Yeah, I've got some thoughts and putting our thoughts together in a couple of minutes, but yeah, that's a question, and then we'll try and bring it to some sort of conclusion. Um, well, it's actually more of an observation than a question, but I could ask a couple of minor questions afterwards. Anyway, um, frankly, I'm not satisfied with the improvement plan including that preventative support is inadequate. <clears throat> and the sentence about family group conferences to reduce looked after children has been deleted. Um, I am unhappy about a couple of the measures that matter and they do not include looked after children and family group conferences. Also baseline and target end quarter one, quarter one's past, and target end of quarter two are missing. Um, I um, the gist of the um, as mentioned earlier by me, the rate of looked after children in Herefordshire is twice the rate it should be. You mentioned the independent review into children's social care. And the gist of that is that there isn't enough preventative work and there's too much care proceedings. And that results in the expense. Um, children, in, children in care is very expensive. It's probably averaging 40,000 a year. So you can do a hell of a lot of, excuse my language, preventative work for that. Right. Do you want me to um, query it? The couple of questions are, so and, and my desired outcome is for the committee to recommend that the improvement plan is reviewed 
and revise, possibly by a spot let review. And by the way, in my opinion, the measures that matter, they're not smart. For instance, there is no dates, etc., and a lot of targets are missing. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, you meant because I take it that what's in Appendix B is the actual measures that matter rather than what was on the earlier presentation. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. anyway, they in the it states the um, the number of complaints we receive is reducing, and I suggest that there's a better wording earlier on, which is that complaint should be resolved at stage two. It's in other words, thirty seven, excuse me, it's on page thirty seven of the report that you're referring to. About about the resolved in other in other yeah, words, nineteen sixteen on page thirty seven. Yeah, right. Report. Okay. Um, and is measures that matter it, nine is the proportion of assessments by children's social care resulting in no further action, and it's got in brackets proportionate response for families. Reducing is low and good. So does further action basically mean that the file is closed effectively? In other words, you think that the child is safe within the, the family, the birth family? It could be close to children's social care, but it may be picked up by maybe picked up by the voluntary and community sector or more okay. appropriate or the early mm -hmm. health service. So the, these measures and matters are mainly in relation to this core statutory offer that the service is looking to really prioritise and develop because the priority of children being safe is that is the is, yeah. is a paramount. So it wouldn't mean that the, the child wouldn't get a response. Yeah. It would mean that we would yeah. ideally yeah. signpost. Yeah, perhaps you could explain what no further action actually actually means. I know what it means on the service, but that's what it means as I've just that's described. Yeah. It, it, no it, further action to statutory services. Yeah. Right, so that means that assessment's been completed and we don't find any need or risk, but that doesn't mean to say that we wouldn't yeah. step it down to early help or out to the community. And right, so you, yeah. you, so, and you said for reducing, so in other words, you want to reduce, you want to reduce, yes, of the course, we don't want children coming in, yeah, we don't want right. children coming into statutory services unnecessarily when we know that um, we get a better service at the earliest opportunity within the early help and targeted help. Um, Chair, if we're going to go through the plan individually, it might be something that we can do offline with, with individual. Sorry, Lisa. I said if we're going to go through the plan action by action, it might be something that we might be able to do as officers offline. Yes, um, I've not personally do that. Because it's a very detailed and critical plan and it has already been signed off by... Uh, That's why exactly. I've been, exactly. Yes. Thank you for your... I had your comment here. Yeah. The I was going to, but yeah, it's it was quite nicely to something up. Did you want to say something else? Can we just make one uh, comment? Is for instance the an example is you say preventative on the on the presentation earlier you said that preventative strategy formulation is underway and it's got September 2022. Right, so I don't quite know whether it starts if that's a target date or when you start doing uh, doing the strategy. So my reading of the report is that all of the preventative things, they're not targeted and they may be done and they may not may not be done. Um, just one final point, the one of the main problems is having enough foster parents. Obviously, if you reduce the number of children who are locked after, that will reduce the number, the costs of, will reduce the problem with sufficiency. I, I did take your note and thank you for the work you did and feeding back. I'd rather hear the covering case you haven't raised it. We've had a lot of um, comment and I, I'd just like to summarize what I think some of the key points, see if you all agree. First of all, you touched upon it, Elisa, about the current state of the approval plan. I understand it's like a draft version which hasn't gone to government yet. It's going to the next government, I think. And I it's been, signed off. It's been right. signed off, Chair, but I think one of the key messages is that it's always going to be subject to change and be based on prioritisation and, and actions as they come on board. And we are subject, you know, to offset, saying we will be looking to revise and refresh um, so the actual documents. So, yeah. It has been signed off. It has been signed off. It has. Yeah, okay. But I take the point that people have mentioned that 
looking for measures and timescales are the key things that obviously help us to scrutinize how things are changing. So the first thing is um, we're getting close, I believe, after nearly a year to be able to look at some key measures that we can see how the improvement plan is actually working in practice, which is great. I don't think we're there yet. I think there's still some more stuff we need to do and some more stuff we probably need to ask the executive to be looking at. Because my second point is making the same point that uh, Councillor Andrews made. How you present this to us in a way that's meaningful and we can review it against the actions that you're you're actually saying you should we should be measuring against. Mm -hmm. uh, on that list, there's 16 indicators, just a list of them, and we've got a number of other indicators that we suggested today, like looked after children, which we don't think is only really covered, uh, like uh, how you're going to measure listening, the voice of the child, that should be something that should be in there. Um, uh, the stability of the workshop is we've got, you know, churn. We, we haven't got it, it's not in there, but actually we've measured the petition, participation of the report, how we work with partners. And thinking about what you said, two things particularly occurred to me about how we might be able to reconstruct the measures in a way that delivers against the plan is by moving those measures to the six work programs that you say you have. So how do the measures relate to each of those six work programs? And if that was in some sort of matrix, as Councillor Andrews has suggested, we could then scrutinise by six work programs instead of our 16 yeah. measures or whatever we've got. And I think the other thing is you mentioned late practice development boards. Well, that could be also an item of measurement, how the boards are working. So that reduces to a smaller number, even though there might be quite, quite a number of metrics. So I, I would like to, and the other thing I like is the budget. How is the budget being used and how much has gone and what's been spent on, apropos what it was found to be spent on. And the other thing I've got down here is with the training we've had from the LGA is what we should be doing is saying, is our plan like this actually relating to the corporate objectives of the, of the council? So how do the measures that we've got in here relate to whether they actually meet the corporate objectives of the current ruling party? Because that's we're told that's what we should be ensuring scrutiny covers. So what I'd like to suggest is we go away from here with the points we've got. Um, so the deputy chair and officers take all the points we've raised today to suggest to the executive they should be saying that we would like the measure to be presented by the item I just mentioned and we then make sure that when we have the next meeting that, that, that it is presented to us in that way so we can actually as I say measure it against key work areas rather than individual measures. Would everybody feel that would be a good way to proceed? Yeah, I think that's absolutely brilliant. It's a really good idea with them. Um, but I also think we need to have a baseline and we need to have it quite soon. Well, that would, be, that would be part of it. Yeah, we need to know where we are now quite. before yes. we start assessing any measures. And, and Phil has like got all of the time. time scale. Well, Sorry, Councillor. Not only time scales, but a baseline of information. Well, I mean, we, we are. Obviously, we've just done the timescales for the work programmes, but we are going through the improvement plan, prioritising, rag rating, and bring that back with those measures. And Phil uh, has brought the baseline data for you as a starting point, which we would we would start in terms of developmental milestones throughout the plan. Um, what we didn't want to do, uh, knowing that you've got another huge meaty item in terms of send, was was give a whole a whole yeah. raft of stuff but and what we could, we could do in our pre-meet with yourselves is obviously go through the structures that we've got and the and um, how we've chunked it up in terms of those measures that matter and then share that with the wider scrutiny if that's helpful great thank you do so we all agree that's a way forward we certainly yeah, propose that's that fine. We, we can present that for yeah, you thank you yeah. i think that, that makes perfect sense. Jones, did you say yes oh, thank you yeah. a seconder councillor stone all those in favor great thank you very much Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I know, Lisa, you wanted to get away, didn't you? Yeah, sorry, I've got to go back to no, Austin. But thank you very much for your time and for your comments, which are helpful. Nice to meet you all. Okay, I don't know anybody else. I could do the five minute uh, coffee break. <laughs> so, can we take literally five minutes, please? Uh, with Democratic Service, can I confirm that? The, no, it just takes a moment to reboot. It should be confirmed. Thanks. Thank you and welcome back everybody. Welcome back. Now back to item seven, the agenda, 
role and objectives of the children and young people's group committee. I don't think there needs to be a lot of discussion about this, as we know, in our work programs, um, sorry, in our um, briefing sessions that we had, we talked a lot about the objectives of different scrutiny committees and how they relate to each other. Hopefully you've all seen the document, the Children Young People Scrutiny Committee role on objectives, and also there's a document um, on general scrutiny and how general scrutiny works in relation to each other. Does anybody have any particular questions to raise, or can we regard those as being noted and agreed are uh, our objectives uh, and role for the year? And presumably you all see them on that bit. Any comment or can we propose that we do that? Oh, that's not that that yeah. be accepted now. But it's a German. Hillary, yes. So you want to make the hammers up? Sorry, Chair. I, I, I'm, I was here to do the SEN presentation. Are, are we coming back round to that? You're coming back to that after this, yes. Oh, that's okay. Sorry. You just, I, you just yeah. come back to the original agenda now. Okay. Sorry. No, you, you're not forgotten. Don't worry. I thought this would be a quick item. It looks like it might be. So, Councillor John Joe proposed and we know it's an exempt. Yeah. You know, Second there. Councillor Stone. Any discussion anyone wants to have? Uh, all those in favour? Thank you. And thank you to Michael and uh, Steve uh, and all our work we've done and to Phil using the cover as well. We're using this document. Great, thank you. Right, now we can look at the next major part of this meeting, which is special education needs and disabilities. Now, just for the sake of the people who are listening, we did have a really very constructive briefing session during the week on the whole issue of SEND education within the authority, including feedback on um, special schools and parent groups. So we had feedback on the parent, parent, the parent care group, the Marshall Summer Network, the head teacher of Brookfield School, head teacher of Westfield School. Uh, we also had somebody who formed the uh, task, which is an autism special interest group. And we also had head of the SEN for the council. We're all presented to most of us here the issues involved with SEN education, uh, including autism. And we're going to look at that and the focus on um, autism, provision, and nurture next. And as Lily really quite rightly says, she's here to present to us. So, can I hand over to you, Lily, please? Yes, certainly. Kerry, did you want to come in before I start? Yeah, Chair, very quick introduction for me, Chair, if I may, and then I'll hand back to Please, Hillary. Re really quickly, folks, thank you. I know Les Knight leads on this issue, and he le led the briefing a couple of weeks ago. Les gives his apologies. He's unable to be at work today, uh, which is why he got me as the B team presenting it and introducing it. In reality, though, this is not all things SEND. This is a very specific project. It's, yeah. uh, it's about autism, the autism provision and the nurture hubs. And I'm grateful to Hillary and to Maria and Jenny um, for kind of fielding any questions you may have this afternoon. They're much closer to the detail than I am. Just by just by way of a quick reminder, though, you remember the report we referenced in the previous item about the impact of the pandemic on children's mental health and well-being. Um, this work actually slightly predates that, but it's very timely, um, which is good. Um, and it mainly is in relation to a kind of large spike in demand for all things special needs post-pandemic, even though this the thinking around this predated some of the, the post-pandemic report we wrote earlier. Uh, so it should be Les. Les is happy to answer any questions that may come to him uh, that we can't answer between us today. So I'm going to hand over to Hillary, if I may, because Hillary is much closer to the detail than I am. And, and then with your uh, permission, Chair, I have to go off and meet Ofsted myself um, actually 25 minutes ago. So with your permission, I'll hand over to Hillary. No, and Hillary then go I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry we stopped and delayed you. No, no. We really no. appreciate you being here. And no. as I elucidated on some key points, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, so please do um, absent yourself. Yes. We're very grateful you came, and thanks for your report. Thank you. They, they won't miss me, honestly. Thanks, folks. Oh, Good luck with always, it. Okay. Always, miss, always miss you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, yeah, I think it is important to point out, as uh, Kerry says, we did have a brief session on the whole of the SEND working, uh, sorry, education environment, but we aren't have time to look at the whole of SEND. So we particularly said we'd like to look at to the microscope of autism for this particular session. We will come back to send at another time. But just bear in mind that Hillary makes a point 
we did have a lot of comment on autism in the feedback during that, that workshop session. So there was a lot of relevant stuff on autism during the whole area. If we want to come to ask questions, and when we come to drawing conclusion recommendations, can you just remember we're looking at autism specific? And, and, and I appreciate you've got observations to make, councillors, but we're not about making observations, we're about asking questions. So please restrict your comments to asking questions rather than making observations, which obviously don't take us any further forward in scrutinising anything. Okay, Hilary, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Hilary. Thank you, Kerry. Um, if I've got some slides, if um, I shall share my screen. Um, just make sure I'm sharing screen two. Here we go. Are we seeing the slides? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, so um, I'm I the um the paper that is the background to to these slides um is has been circulated to you already, but um I just want to uh, sort of close some of those bits off. So the current autism provision uh, that we have in Herefordshire is here in the black, and then the underdevelopment. But some of the 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 things that are under development, it isn't just in the pipeline. These are things that are are um, already, some of these things are already um, in process. So, for example, the autism education uh, trust training in mainstream schools, we've got um, nearly half of our schools now have um, received that training. Uh, we've got another 25 who've already signed up to receive that training um, in the next academic year. So by then we will have three quarters um, of our school so we just need a, a last final push to um, to get those last um, sort of 25 ish schools on board to um, have received that training um, the additional capacity at Hampton Dean the um, so some additional capacity has already been created but further capacity is needed so we need to do some sufficiency work there so that we are um, you know commissioning um, places at the right in the right place um for the right for the right need um we are considering uh making uh well supporting uh a, a, a school to make a, a free school bid to um uh, have a, an autism and learning disability school so at the moment um this sort of goes hand in hand with the need to reduce the use of independence. So we haven't got sufficient capacity at the moment in our um, local authority schools um, and academies to support children with autism and learning disability. Um, so we have to commission out um, to independent and uh, non-maintained special schools, which means, and, and they are generally just outside Herefordshire. So we've got children commuting to Powys or Shropshire perhaps, um, or, or uh, Gloucestershire. Um, and so so if we can um, get, you know, obviously that comes with it. There's um, the, the travel time for children. Um, some children find that quite anxiety inducing, um, which, you know for children with autism isn't isn't um ideal um so yes we are going to um ask for um schools in herefordshire or organizations in herefordshire to um if they would like to work with us um to to bid for um, funding to develop a new free school similar to the um project we did with um Bars Court were um, the school that worked with us to develop the Beacon College, um, so that sort of um, that sort of uh, model. Um, so that's our autism provision um, nurture hubs. So this is um, to not this. These are children who may not have a diagnosis of autism. They may later have a diagnosis of autism, um, but. Um, it's primarily to address attachment difficulties in childhood trauma. Um, so um, it's in, in primary schools at the moment. So um, the schools that we've already been um, working with um, are listed there and it's an intensive one year. So children are selected um, 
from within the school to um, attend the nurture hub within the school grounds, which is staffed by specially trained um staff supported by the behavior support team supported by the educational psychology service um and uh with the hope being that that one year of intensive work uh, with those youngest children um will give that child the strategies that they need to be able to reintegrate into mainstream classrooms um or it might be that um, that one year is, is an assessment, really, that this child has needs that um, are probably not going to be met in mainstream and that a special school is going to be required. So it might go either way at the end of that year. Um, I hope, obviously, is that the, that the children develop the strategies that they need to, to be able to moderate their behaviour or um, sometimes with children um, it might be that they've got speech and language difficulties that so they're communicating through their behaviour so we you know we can work with them on that so that they find other ways to express how they're feeling um, and and then they're able to reintegrate um, but so um, that's that's and it's sort of we're coming to the end of the first year of that and then we are hoping to start working with a secondary school um, in September, um, the same model, but um, but with um, year sevens, um, because what we know is um, our exclusion data is concerning at the moment. The nationally, um, post pandemic, more children um, are being excluded than they were pre pandemic. Herefordshire is in in line with with um, the rise that we're seeing nationally, um, but but generally. I think head teachers know, um, uh, you know, fairly early on children that are going to struggle and, and potentially may face exclusion. So if we can get them into a nurture hub in a secondary school, this is our hypothesis that we test night with the pilot project. If we can get that intensive work, um, you know, early on in their secondary career, then, um, you know, they, they should be able to um, develop the skills that they need to, because you know uh, especially coming from a primary school where things are more predictable you're with the same teacher all day you know what is expected of you um you're with the same peers all day and so you have less stress on you and you go into secondary school all these additional um uh, environments and uh, personalities to to navigate and and to 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 try and assess out where you fit in it it can um you know you, you do need a different set of skills to sort of be able to um to get your way through um so hopefully that uh that project will support those children and then we've also been using um a um a specially trained teaching assistant um based at alton primary um to go out and work with children who are um who have experienced some sort of trauma and are um, sort of starting they they've been showing signs of school avoidance so that they would they find home environment much less stressful um, much less anxiety provoking so um, and obviously go coming into some of the um, if they're, if they're happier at home then the outreach is the idea is that you build up the relationships at home and then um, be able to then bring those strategies into school so we've been using that for some children in the north of the county so that's nurture hubs um now i did talk about this when i came in i'm going to say uh march did i come to scrutiny in march and talk about the graduated response um did, yes i did i thought it was march I, yes i thank can't remember exactly march but you did come it was earlier this year wasn't it yes um, so um, this, I've just put this up again so you can see where our nurture hubs and um, uh, the autism hubs would um, fit in with the um, our graduated pathway. So um, they're at the, the the sort of towards the 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 um, sort of more intensive support end. Um, and then we've also got our emotionally based school avoidance project, which is um, EBSA. So um, this is run by our educational psychology service. Um, so they have produced guidance and a toolkit for schools to look at um, ways that. So for those young people who whether so it could be because they have autism and are anxious because 
well people with autism have um a higher level of anxiety often um or it could be children that have experienced some trauma and are anxious that um this is so it the idea i shall show you what the idea of it is here we are so phase one um as soon as schools start realizing that attendance is dipping below 90 percent um that the school the 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 um, toolkit for the schools has um, ideas of um, how to engage with the child, um, um, different uh, strategies and activities that you can do with that child um, so that that um, you can try and prevent attendance uh, falling even lower. If there is persistent absence after even with that support in place for six weeks, um, then there's a, a step up um, and perhaps do some um, assessments to see if there are any learning needs that are causing that young person to be anxious um, and then the if they have stopped attending regularly after six weeks of that support then the um, educational psychologist service will step in and can do some direct work with the child and the family to see if they can get that young person back into school um, so so that's um, the next slides I've got is how the um, the the green paper sort of fits in with this but I don't know if you want me to pause for questions now because specifically around um the autism and I can't see any questions at the moment hey Councillor Paul would like to ask you a question oh thank you very much Hilary um, it looks great um I'm just uh I'd like to know um well how long have we known about the, the insufficiency has been something that's been building over a number of years, hasn't it? In relation, that's right, yeah. In, in relation to provision, and I suppose each year it's seen a jump from what you've presented to us. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know, um, I know that you're looking for a place for another provision, is that right? Are you considering Peter Church and the new school bill? Sorry, am I consider are we considering? Peter Church, Peter Church, and the new school build. Um, to, what to be a, a hub? Yeah. No, in the in the paper at the moment, the autism hub is um, being considered the um, expanding at uh, Hampton Dean at the moment. Um, so where we've already got provision, um, and we are not looking. For, so at the moment, our autism hub for um, high school pupils is at the Bishop of Hereford Bluecoat School. Um, now, whilst they do a brilliant job, um, they it's a very small um, base within the school. Um, you have still got to navigate 990 other children before you get to your autism base. So um, maybe looking at something that is separate because the, the bridge is within the school it's not a separate part you know yes. and, and the idea being that those young people get the support so that they can integrate and um, so you wouldn't want them you know hived off somewhere separately so this this um hub proposal would be for those that can't cope with that sort of environment so it would be somewhere else so we haven't identified a site for that yet because we would be hoping that a school would would work with us to apply for this free school bid so that's you know we'll be looking for applications for that in due course okay so it has to be from it's, it's just that i know that they're redesigning the school and and that there's going to be provision for some sort of special educational needs or, uh, or nurture or family hub of some sort so um and there's very little in the south of the county definitely not in my area at all so um, I'm just placing a little marker in the sand and asking that that be considered. I mean, possibly the build's too far away, but um, in, in time, rather. So if you're watching. So the other question that I had is the, um, the EBSA, um, is that the money that was um, given by government for attendance officers that you're using to do that? Or is that still swimming around somewhere? No, the attendance officers that um 
we haven't been given any funding just yet for attendance officers, to my knowledge. Um, um, that's not... something that was talked about last time, Kerry talked Yes, about. So, so we are, yes, so you're absolutely right. So the white paper says that um, from 2023, we will um, be, yeah, the local authority will have to have some sort of attendance, monitoring, officer support. Um, what that looks like is... Um, yeah not quite defined there's no guidance yet um so there will be so that's attendance officers yes um uh, this is more this is run by our uh, um educational psychology service so it's an established team that is already here they're all it's it's just um a different way of them doing their work um other than you know they've got their statutory work they have to do with the sen team but this is in addition to that so schools can invite them in schools don't have to do this but yeah. Um, you know they, they can choose to um, but and and our hope is that the guidance that the um, that is provided not not many children hopefully if 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 phase one and phase two are followed we're not going to see many it's about that really really early identification the you know the moment they start to have those wobbles they start to say I don't feel comfortable going to school I'm worried about that I'm not happy there you know it's not waiting until oh well they've not been in properly for six weeks what are we going to do about it it needs to be you know they, they've started saying this um so what is it about you know are they um you know we, we've got some children who um of struggling with learning and they don't want to look foolish in front of their friends so they would rather not go to school we've got some children um who um because because they've started a new school during covid they don't feel they've got any friendship groups so they you know they they find that that hard to to um, negotiate when they get in so it, it lots of different reasons but it is trying to you know get in there really really early um and and the, the guidance um it it's I mean I can circulate a copy if, if people want it but it's it's things like um talks about having a soft landing so how does that child get get welcomed into school first thing in the morning um and so um you know at transition points what are schools doing to make sure that everybody feels really included and part of this new community um and so all those sorts of things which schools can be doing without any any in you know any input from us but just lots of ideas and strategies and I yeah Yes. What, as, as, so, so just the last little bit. So what um, cost implications for school transport are there for these children who are identified and have to travel from where they should go in their catchment to a nurture home, or is it just catchment children that are in a So with the nurture hub, the majority, so each hub has seven children and uh, five of those will be from within that school so we have targeted schools where um the, we know that there is a higher number of children who have um who are identified as sen support or have an ehcp for social emotional and mental health difficulties so so they in theory will have a larger cohort of children needing that so um and we've also looked at factors like um social deprivation free school meals uh children on child protection plans children who are looked after so we've taken in a whole range of factors on selecting these schools so five children will come from within that school already so there isn't that they already go to that school and two children will come from a, a, a feeder school but it will be the near they'll go to their nearest one so there might be some minor transport issues some parents are happy that for one year that they will transport their child and we have other parents who either can't drive or it's not convenient because they've got to take another child to school in the opposite direction and then transport is um provided for those children thank you i've got a couple more councillor questions but just to follow up on what councillor Hewitt just asked i'm going to ask a similar question um i think you partly answered it by saying that you've located the hubs where the larger cohort of young people with autism are based. So you're going somewhere ready to fit the requirement of the one paper, because clearly where the hubs are will determine whether people attend them or not. So in order to meet the requirement, you need to have the hubs in place beforehand, so they don't have to go too far to get to it. So it will put them off going, because yeah. they've got a hand in hand, don't they? Yes. So, so the... 
we were so and just to be clear that the the nurture hubs are not for children with autism the nurture hubs are for children with anxiety or trauma or attachment difficulties behavioral difficulties um some of those children may later in life end up with a, a diagnosis of autism because it, but at, at the point where they are they they won't probably have that diagnosis um but um i've lost my train of thought now i do apologize um oh yes about the travel so um we we did think about the fact that if if you have been so for example Leinster Primary is one of the schools that has a nurture hub so uh, it's quite possible that you will send your child to Leinster Primary School for 12 months um, and they will get this intervention and then you might not want to move them back to this their, the nearest school you might want to keep them there because hopefully if this intervention has worked they're now familiar with the routines and the 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 rules and the the peer group and everything at that primary school so it might be that then the parent will say I want to keep them at Leominster primary school or whichever school it might be um, but not in the hub and so the schools are aware that they may end up with the extra odd child here or there. Okay, thank you. We've got three question, questions for you. First one, Mr. Sam Prassi, a question. Yeah, thank you. Just on the um, the new school, free, new free school provision, um, how will schools or organisations be able to make an application to be part of that? And how will you decide which is the preferred partner? Um, that's a question that I'd have to take back to Les Knight. Um, I know that what happened last time um, when we were looking to for a post 16 provision, um, any any school could could apply. Um, and so, yeah, I, su I suppose we will be telling schools in Herefordshire, this is, you know, this we're looking for a partner to work with us on this and we'll see who who applies i can't tell you what the criteria will be because i don't know them sorry but i can i can take that back to les and find out thank you do, do you know when we can expect that what the answer or when no no, no when we <laughs> might expect you to come out to the schools and organizations to make them aware that it's something to think about um i will I, again i haven't got a time scale for that in the next academic year i know is but whether it will be this side of christmas or not i'm not entirely sure Okay, that's something we would obviously like to get time scale for, but we can come back and get what you say let's hopefully we can give us a better answer on that. Uh, next, uh, Cancer Jones. Um, thank you. Yeah, you talked about the 38 schools that have been trained or are signed up for training through the Autism Education Trust. Um, could you give me exact numbers that have been trained on that? Is it, could you just say about 25 are signed up? Is it the next? 38 have already been trained. 38 have been trained. It's yeah, yeah, and, okay. and 25 have signed up already for the for for in the next academic year already. So yeah. that's yeah, so we just need to target those last few schools. What 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 prevents them from coming forward or is it is that quite a slow take up or what's the incentive? Is it it or is it staff or money or no, 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 it's it's the, the it's free. I think it's 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 um busyness of schools, if I'm honest with you. Um it just yeah, and we just need to push the that this is a priority for them and they need to be doing it. And they have got a lot of training, you know, all the schools need to be doing their prevent training, their safeguarding training, they they'll you know, there'll be lots of different types of training that schools will want to be doing with all their staff. So we just need to be pushing it and I think the that it's starting to pick up because um schools that have done it have said it's it's really good you know we we've learned from it it's 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 worthwhile training so then you know and word of mouth is always the best in these sorts of things isn't it thank you thank you uh Council Fabian you had a question yeah th thanks Hilary uh, the questions about animal-based and land-based um, kind of interactions uh, for for children at these nurture hubs is there any evidence um, that that supports the the use of you know, um, animals in kind of helping children actually deal with their anxiety and also land-based activities so forest schools for example is is that is there any way these are being incorporated into the hubs? Nearly all the schools in Herefordshire um, 
I just this is anecdotally I could go away and try and find out but it probably not over the summer holidays I think nearly all the primary schools have some sort of forest school um, provision now regardless of um, whether they are um, a nurture hub or not and a lot of our schools now have got some sort of they a lot of them have got therapy dogs there's a therapy cat somewhere there is another animal that I can't remember it was a a therapy rabbit I'm going to say but you know don't quote me on that but so lots of the schools now are um without having a nurture hub are recognizing the benefits of of um sort of animal uh, interventions um and the I would say the primary schools are better with forest schools than um the secondary schools which are generally more traditional for want of a better word and um but but there are schools that will um put bespoke alternative provision in for those pupils um and and they will have a bespoke timetable so that they'll get some land-based activity um as part of their timetable thanks it's just that i i think a lot of the kind of anxiety that children have about school is is based around the institution you know the institution itself and so actually sort of having sort of activities that take them out of the classroom is is probably quite helpful um it okay. is and i think it schools would say um i think they'd say that they would love to do more of that sort of thing but um that you know their hands are tied pretty much by um the expectations on them to deliver other things in the curriculum but i think that's the crux of the problem isn't it is that actually the it's the curriculum and that is actually stressing children out and the the, the capacity so so the, this is where the hubs are really important yeah. in actually addressing it that is. Where, where the curriculum's not meeting the the kind of that other need of the the children so yeah I mean, I understand the dilemma that schools are in, but it's yeah, and, and sadly, out. sadly, there's that's not something that we, as a local authority, because because schools are inspected by Ofsted, and and you know they receive their guidance straight from the DfE. So th I think that they all know what they would like to be doing more of. Um, I think they they do have this dilemma of having to deliver a broader balanced curriculum and um, they are you know they they have to publish their their data on children that achieve expected levels in English and maths you know these are the things that you know GCSEs uh, uh, results will be published in um, and, and comparisons will be made so and and I completely know where you're coming from but that's the dilemma that schools are faced with yeah, I'm. I'm really sorry. Just, just to 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 kind of drill down into that because if that's you know if if we all kind of recognise that, and then are our net nurture hubs kind of destined to fail because actually they're not addressing the kind well, of core issue or well, ideally a nurture hub is doing that that intensive work. So children need to be settled before they they learn. So if the the children are given the skills and given the strategies to help them regulate, um that that they they will need less of the special support and will be able to integrate back into mainstream schools or it might be that they they don't have they're not able yet to to do that and they might need specialist provision going forward so um and, and that might be a special school you know, so you have you any more slides to present to us well, only if you wanted me to just very briefly talk through, well, I appreciate how I pushed you off for time, um, talk through um, the context of the uh, the green paper, the SEND green paper. I think that would be useful because at the end, we want to draw from you really what we can do as scrutiny to help make sure that education, autism is improved. Okay. So green paper is a, a very important part of understanding that, isn't it? Okay. If I share my screen again then. Please. There we go. So I, I'm sure you've all read the green paper because it's a nice. See it yet. Oh, we can you not? See no. That's better. Okay. So, yeah. There we are. <laughs> I doubt we can say we've all read the green paper. Well, no. I, I, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a 
an excellent yeah. read. I thoroughly recommend it to all of you. Um, but yeah, so the <laughs> um, but basically, in a nutshell, so the objective of the Green Paper is um, well, it, it's that ch all children, regardless of their um, special educational need or disability, um, can fulfil potential, uh, fulfil their potential, and lead happy, healthy, and productive lives. However, the overarching messages from the Green Paper are that navigating the SEND system and alternative provision is too complicated for children and families they it, it, and that it's very very process driven and, and and families are very very frustrated because they can see what they want to get to they can see the end goal but trying to get to it they it it's uh, yeah um it's very frustrating for them um outcomes for children young people um with send or in alternative provisions are consistently not as good as um, their peers in every um, key stage one two four um, key stage five it's it's not not good um, and that's nationally not just locally um, and we spend a lot of money um, on the send process the um, the way we fund children in schools and it's uh, yeah a large amount of money is spent and outcomes are not um not not um good uh and that's nationally so um one of the reasons is that the way that schools identify difficulties is inconsistent. Um, some schools and settings are not set up to identify and support children with specific needs, especially when you think about some of our very small schools in Herefordshire. Um, that, that you know, if if one teacher assistant is off, um, you know, they they may not have somebody else that they can draw upon to support a child. Um, Parents aren't sure what they can expect from their schools. Um, for some people, it seems that the um, having an education, health and care plan is the only way that they can get support. So we know, um, and as I spoke at the scrutiny panel uh, committee I came to previously, we've got a whole range of graduated support that we expect um, our schools um, to put in place. Um, but some some families think that the only way that they can get the right support is to get their child an education health and care plan so it's um which, which is very time consuming and that can lead to frustrations and um yeah um and and it, the, there is a pressure on um, our specialist provision which sometimes means um just uh I think it was Councillor Hugh said about, you know, long journeys. You haven't got anything in the Golden Valley. Everybody's got to come into Hereford or wherever. Um, so because we can't put a special school in every area, it's, you know, just can't do it. Um, and um, all the resource and effort and, you know, it's very weighted towards the sort of specialist end, which means that we haven't got as, as much that we can put in earlier on to try and prevent things from escalating. So um, the, the Green Paper identifies that um, nationally we spend a lot of money and nobody's very satisfied and that's not because people aren't trying you know nobody is waking up in the morning thinking i don't want to do a good job today everybody is trying their hardest but um we're not seeing um much in the way of results from that um it's good there it says it, that all schools should be more inclusive um and that there should be national standards so that's um, national standards for identifying children with send um, national standards for what should be provided um, the quality of an education health and care plan there's lots of standardization um, but some of that's open to interpretation um, there is a bit of tension between the education white paper and the send review um, because if you want to improve um, your results, you might not want to have so many children with SEND, possibly, if you were um, that way inclined as a school. I'm not suggesting that we've got any schools like that in Herefordshire, incidentally. It's just, you know, I can see nationally that, um, that there might be people trying to push others out. Um, and, yeah, the, the, the EHC system... Um, um, I mean, Les wrote this slide about the, the per perverse incentive. It's, it's that thing, I've got to get a plan. I've got to get a plan for my child. Um, and that, that 
that that that is costly um you know because a lot of people are required to assess that child and and the time so yeah um whereas a lot of support as i've said previously can be put in place without a plan um and the solutions are not very um the solutions that the green paper puts forward are, don't appear very robust but um it's a consultation so we shall see um but in herefordshire so we are quite well um placed to um implement these recommendations so um a lot of the model that they are suggesting um we we've already got um, something similar in place as it happens already um we've got um a good um i think that you saw last week um with the parent carer representatives we've got good um good networks with um, parent carer representative groups we've got a co-production charter so we you know we've already got that in our favor um we yes yeah, some of these things is the pro model we've already got in place we've already got a funding matrix we've got good relationships the fact that jenny and marie have given up their time to be here in case you had any questions for them um i think demonstrates that you know we are you know we are a, a, a cohesive um partnership group um and you know we've already got some of some of these elements in place so the bits that will be more of a challenge and so to come to your question what can you help with um the strategic leadership who needs to do what it doesn't say yet who needs to do what in terms of these um send partnerships and what they should look like and who should do what um but you know mm -hmm. any any support you can um offer in ensuring that that um it, that people aren't just there names are on a document they come to a meeting they actually everybody needs to be in this and working together um we've got really poor i uh, lisa and uh, phil mentioned earlier about the problems that with mosaic but we have a system called synergy for send and it makes mosaic look state-of-the-art it's really clunky it's really slow um yeah and but nationally, the way that education data is gathered and shared is clunky and slow because um, local authorities and schools don't necessarily have um, automatic sharing. So it's, it's very difficult. And the Green Paper proposes that we're going to move to a digitised education, health and care plan. Um, and so we don't know what that will look like and my worry would be that if we end up with a number of um systems that we can purchase we really do need to get one that works well and i appreciate there's value for money but you know it will just frustrate parents if it is as slow and clunky as the internal systems that we've got um and will just lead to more officer time and time of your own as your parents in in your constituencies will be coming to you to say that the digital ehcp at the local authority is no use um we need to so uh, um, the disco is it's not a party it's the designated social care officer we need um support in um uh, look at how that will look we um there's, there's going to be a statutory requirement that social care will need to have a, a designated officer um to oversee um send work um and i think that's yeah there will there'll be some funding that will probably come to um cabinet to sign off when when the regional work is done so um that's that's my slides so um in terms of what you can do to help um what can you do to help well um i suppose any any if if you can keep it on your agenda so that um you know you can be asking questions um you know when decisions are being made about uh you know, does a, is there a, a new IT system needed for social care? Is there a new IT system needed for um, SEND? Um, if, if you've got a designated person in social care for this, if you've got a designated social care person for, for SEND? So I suppose it's those questions that you as scrutiny can be considering when you hear further, you know, items in, in other meetings is just keep this in the back of your mind and think, how does that... Um, 
because we have you know we've got over a thousand children now with an education health and care plan in Herefordshire um so you know that's a lot of children they are living in 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 all of your wards um and and their parents will be coming to you to talk about their frustrations with the system with the provision so yeah anything that you can do when you're scrutinizing plans and things to to keep that in mind um would would benefit us all i'm sure thank you hillary yeah i mean obviously you do a lot of hard work in pretty one of the most frustrating of areas never being able to really completely satisfy the outcomes and yeah i was thinking what can we do to help and uh We'll come back to a conclusion in a minute. I know Councillor Hewitt wants to ask you another question, and then I think we need to move on and come to some conclusion. Well, one of the things that I reflected on when um, I was looking at your papers was that I, I went back to the consultation response for capital investment for provision. So the consultation response that went out to parents and you know, what they wanted to see. And one of the things that we came across it when we were talking about Westfields is that there were there were comments against what they were their responses were which was saying you're talking about an assessment program not about a capital investment and my reflection is that you know if you get the assessment right then the capital the capital investment sort of goes down so if you if you are assessing a child and you get that right in the first place then the need, because you're going into early health, for, for a big capital investment. But they're, they're sort of one and the same thing, aren't they? Because especially when you're dealing with children who have a lot of anxiety, you have to actually assess. It's part and parcel, parcel of the capital assessment because you have to assess the impact of the geography and the location and the space that they're going to be in. So... Um, I think it's a sort of, I don't know whether strategically that's a help to think about that, but I, I definitely think that sometimes the two things merge and that a capital investment also reflects what the assessed needs are in terms of geography and individual need for the child. So I just wanted to make that point. I don't know whether I made it clearly enough. Well, you made a point. Uh, thank you. I think that to uh, move on, but Councillor Andrew, if you had a question you wanted to ask. Yeah, it's really well presented, Hilary. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here about where does this fall in the Ofsted review? Under which section does it come under? So if you've got IT systems that are failing, if you need the help. Uh, the, the, the so so we've, there's two Ofsted inspections. So the Ofsted inspection that we are currently, as a local authority, uh, undergoing as we speak that's called the ILAX inspection inspection of local authority children's services and then there is also a send inspection which is completely separate now we will we are due one because we were I, oh, 2014 I think is the last time we had our send inspection reviewed um and um the I so I imagine we will probably in the next 12 months potentially um have uh, an offset inspection of our send services so that will be um so they they look at health social care and education they will speak to um jenny and they'll speak to maria who are here um to talk about um how health fits into that and how um cams fits with that um yeah so they'll look at the whole system so they will probably look at the the it system then they won't let pick up let, let I don't, me ask them. Let me ask the next with them. So if the last one was in 2014, I'm guessing the action plan is was either completed or it was left to be completed, either way, probably the latter. So we'll be, what you're going to get now should be a, a really good statement of intent from that, that, that assessment. So should we be encouraging that assessment to come and be placed? Should we be arguing and saying, when is that Ofsted inspection going to come to you, so, to so we, we we have can I, a. Can I partly answer that question for you? Because we had a discussion with Dale on this very subject. He has told us that we're, as you exactly saying, Julia, that we're due an offset inspection on send. In his view, it's likely next year. And given what we've just had now, that's more likely to be the case, I would have thought. So you might have pleased to know in the Tuesday, 10th of January 
work plan for this committee, we've got a scrutiny section looking at preparing for what we might do to improve our ascent of the inspection. Okay. I think that answers your question, Graham, and uh, probably answers the point you were raising, but I do get that give as well. Anyway. Can I... We'll be, look, we'll be looking forward to support you after that inspection then, Hilary, I suspect. <laughs> well, um, the, the, so we don't, with the way the send inspection works is they don't give you a, well, unless they, they, they are due to um, put their new inspection framework out. So, so we were inspected under the old inspection framework and the way that worked was you didn't get a grading. So some authorities got a letter of, it was like a letter of improvement, but it wasn't called that. We didn't get one of those. Um, in fact, our SEND inspection was relatively positive. They did give us some actions that we have been. So we have had a SEND strategy group that has been meeting um, six weekly, I think, um, since, since the SEND inspection. Um, and that is chaired by Les Knight from the local authority and Maria um, you are you co-chair or are you vice chair you sometimes chair <laughs> did you want to come in and say something about yes yeah. yeah, certainly i mean in you know council andrews the, the 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 previous inspection in fact was 2016 and we are anticipating one early next year herefordshire didn't receive the letter of improvement which is called a written statement of action but there were some actions to be followed from that so there is a strategic group that involves, um, obviously, Herefordshire Council members, both education and um, social care, but also health colleagues and um, parent carers and health watch um, and others by co so public health attend. And so, so there has been a continual programme to address the needs of children and young people that, that sit within our SEND um, population. And it's really influenced by what parent carers are raising as challenges, but also the, the challenges that schools are facing. So I, I think in terms of this committee's, you know, role to support, I think we, we probably haven't had sufficient scrutiny of, of how effectively we are supporting our SEN population across Herefordshire. And I think scrutiny, although daunting, actually is really beneficial because the tricky questions that will come from those who aren't directly involved are actually hugely important for us to be delivering assurance that we are meeting the needs of our children and young people and their families within their communities wherever possible, and that we're supporting inclusion in your, you know, in a child's local mainstream school, but where there are additional needs, our first thoughts are, well, how can we make that happen as close to where the child lives as possible? And how do we involve other members of the community, both voluntary organisations and others, to support that? So I think, so we, we, have, we have a plan, we have a strategy, we have an action group, um, it's multi-agency, it's effective, but it would benefit, I think, from increased scrutiny and oversight from, from your group. Okay, thank you. If, if, if assuming the committee approves our work plan for next year, we will probably be asking you to come in early January and update us on where we are, so we can then do some effective scrutiny if necessary and recommendations to the executive which might help improve any future of the inspection. Okay. So thank you very much for that. Um, Helen, you had a question. Then yes. We, then we need to sum up. Yes, just, just, um, I've got in front of me here, preparation measures include C, annual conversation with officer, June 22, 2022. What, what's an annual conversation then? Uh, so every year, uh, Ofsted invites uh, officers from the local authority every local authority has one of these um they they tell you in advance what they are likely to want to talk about um so that you can send the right members of staff so this year we sent um somebody from early years so we had our um Early years advisor, our post-16 advisor, Kerry Morgan went, uh, Les Knight for SEN, and um, Daryl, obviously, and I think um, some, I think she was head of 
child protection, head of service of child protection. So those officers all went to Birmingham and met with the lead HMI for Herefordshire. Um, and they, they, they ask, you know, um, it's just a conversation um you know tell me about your policy on this tell me about your plans for that and uh yeah it's yeah. and then they write they write to you following that with uh, it's basically a, a record of that meeting so you don't get a, a a grading or a judgment or anything like that it's just so yeah they you, they do one every year okay thank you can you have your hand up again maria or is that your old hand Yes, sorry, to add to that, uh, alongside the um, the annual conversation with the um, local authority, there's an offer to the local parent carer forums to also meet with the inspectors so that actually there's, that, there's um, a triangulation of um, information sought in order to obviously draw out, you know, what's, what's going well, what's working well, what's delivering positive outcomes for children and young people, but also where the tensions and challenges are. And then that is fed back in the written response um, from the you know, Department of Education inspectors. And then that forms a six monthly meeting at um, local level between the regional inspectors for this area and the, you know, the local authority and partners. So we have six monthly meetings to talk through the areas of challenge and of progress. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I, I'd like to sum up uh, what, what, what we've covered because it seems there isn't potentially what we could do and help by reading the recommendations of the executive board. But I've got several points down here. One is, yes, please said that we circulate the guidance because that would help us understand a little bit more about what the guidance is all about, and we'll, we'll diligent read it. Uh, I was looking at things you said, you, you, you've got bidding for a new free school, well, presumably that's positive and that's going to happen, so it doesn't need any influence on scrutiny to help with that. Um, what it does seem to me we could do, though, is, because when we had the workshop, one of the questions that keep came up was inclusivity, that particularly academies are, are, are quite reluctant often to take on board special education in school because it can, or they perceive it can accept, affect their offset ratings. So I think one of the things I'm looking at your report about saying small engagement seem the needed to encourage schools to be more inclusive, that probably the most positive thing we can do is to say we should adopt a more inclusivity promotion program, some activity of going around all the schools, encourage our senior leaders to say to school, we totally won't affect your offset rating, but the opposite you will improve inclusivity in the community. And that seems to be the thing I think is the best thing we can do as a recommendation to cabinet that they should adopt a more proactive role in encouraging inclusivity. And would that would we agree that's probably a good step forward? Absolutely. And also I think um and this was um all right there were les sent me many many more slides but i slimmed it down but one of the <laughs> one of the slides i took out was um um around the fact that um that that there is very very limited when a school is inspected by Ofsted there is very very limited um scope uh, they they don't look much at send and inclusion um so it, yeah, yes. So, so the, there isn't a lot of scrutiny on schools about that their, their inclusivity. Um, so, yeah, anything that you can do when you are going round and talking to schools, and I appreciate some of you are school governors. So, I, I think it's asking those questions. Um, in my previous role, I was the virtual school head for looked after children, and um, I always used to say when I did governor training, ask the question: How many looked after children have left, and why did they leave? And, no, I and and I think and I think it is it's it, it's saying to how many how many children with SEN have left and why did they leave where did they go why didn't you keep them right and um, so people, it, yeah a thousand people is quite a chunk of our total number of children yeah. education so I, I'd like to suggest that we say we make a recommendation to the executive that they adopt a policy of consciously promoting inclusivity or central in schools. So we'd like to propose that we draft a recommendation accordingly. 
if you agree. Do you agree with that? Yeah, so it was not in the agenda. No, no, it's been recorded. Oh, okay. yeah. So we tend to propose that we do that. I Thank you, John. Yeah. Seconder, Councillor Hewitt. All those in favour? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilary and Maria. Really appreciate it. We've got Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your good work. work. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Steve, you're still there, aren't you? Yes, Chair. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I know you noticed Michael's left, so presumably with a combination of recording and your notes, we'll be able to draw some after a minute, so. Yep, no problem. Great, thank you. Right, we'll move on to the item agenda, then we'll look at our work programme. Now that's on, um, in your act, page 87 onwards. We've done a lot of work on this. Um, I think you know that there are five more meetings scheduled. If you've got any questions, obviously today is the green. On page 30, 89, the September meeting was proposed with a good corporate parenting and placement sufficient with a, um, a workshop on that to cover both uh, subject matter to help us inform us for that. And then we're looking at, oh, and also the children's improvement plan, the, the, the transformation plan, the actual project is going on, the, the transformation plan. 22nd November, we're looking at safeguarding for the top of it, uh, which is really important uh, to safeguarding and help us get the report back on that. And the well being independent review of the Isle of Ireland report, we found that really very helpful last year. And for those on the committee who are educational, we did like to park off the yard. It would seem a good time to look at the education white paper that's coming out. And if I do that for my education people, it would be a good time to scrutinize it. January, I've just said we're looking at first of all, lectures from educated children and children missing education. And I've uh, just said that we might be able to help the executive and the officers concerned prepare for an expected offset. This is on send. March, we've got children child exploitation. Again, the improvement plan, we agreed to look at quarterly. And uh, we've got next update looking at the task and finish group. We said hopefully by March we'd have the input from that, so we would do the input and the recommendations. So that's the finish group. So we've got four, five more events, but I am proposing also that we have a February one because there are five more separate matters that we can possibly cover in the year. We're going to miss the May one that's in the schedule because it'll be between the elections and the council. So those will have another meeting in February. Tackle some of the issues that we need to be looking at. So, I don't know whether that's enough information for you to say, yep, let's go with that work program and we'll review it as we go along. And out of February meeting, is that enough or any comment, conversation, anyone, any discussion? We have put a lot of work in this together with Phil, Steve, and uh, Michael, and your input, of course, initially about an evidence base of what should be covered in the project list. So, we work with that list. Anybody want any comments? Go with it, and including out in a February meeting. Mm -hmm. Opposed, Councillor Hanson. Secondly, Councillor Jones. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Well, the last item on the agenda is the task and finish group. Oh, sorry. Yeah, what were you going to say? Um, yeah, I'm referring to the a meeting for the next meeting, which is in September. Yes. And on the work plan, you mean? Yes. Yeah. And on their um, on the agenda, there's going to be a strategy to safely reduce the number of children in care. I'll just make a co couple of comments on that, or it might be finessed, because I noticed that the only witness is going to be the independent chair of Harry Richardson Safeguarding Partnership. So can I suggest that there's other um, input into it? For instance, possibly um, Family Roots Group or Venture, Charities Venture and Home Start. And possibly there's um, a parents group called A Common Bond. So I think there should be a more variety because the, the Safeguarding Partnership has a particular stance, don't they? Um, they do. And in, in, in line with what we did with SEN. We will we'll hold a briefing session yeah. with that and bring on board those partners that will give us oh. the 
always give us those names because yeah. we will ask for names. Yes, I will do. And also, I suggest the only link on there is one for the Centre of Social Justice, which I think is a slot, which, to be quite frank, is quite right wing. And also, the report mm -hmm. is a, a year out of date. So, I suggest <laughs> that they could have a link to the independent review into children's social care, which is a, a government sponsored program. Um, government sponsored report rather and it's just come out it was came out the final report came out in may of this year so that would be a, a good, a good link as well or to incorporate the information this is a that. provisional program we will review yeah. the list and okay we'll, right we'll read comment on the, the ones you made it's excellent we did that with the same one we came at mm -hmm. the end of this yes yeah and um, um, steve managed to get them all to come so <laughs> yeah everyone has given us that input that'd be really yeah. great Quite right, Phil. You want to make a comment? Yeah, I just thought I'd support uh, Donors' comments. I mean, my last look, uh, local authority, we did exactly what you just suggested and made a big difference. Uh, we were this was a um, uh, uh, local authority on the south coast, which had a vastly, vastly high number of children per capita, and the same as same as what you've summarised. So, you know, uh, um, uh, much higher than the statistical neighbours, and getting the, the voluntary sector on board made a big difference. So, I really welcome that. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a good yeah. suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. So your input into what we should be including and possibly we should look at yeah, really step up. We've now got a month or so to prepare for the meeting. Okay, we've agreed our work program. Uh, the, the last thing, obviously, is the task and finish group. Mm -hmm. Now, we meant to have a presentation on that, but we haven't actually got any mm -hmm. proposed terms of reference to look at. You have got a document. Uh, one of the things I've been doing regularly is going to the local government association quarterly update for speaker chairs, new members and uh, DCSs and Jenny came along with you and they are very worried they're very good but they are excellent and they give you a high level view of what is happening and in particular when I went last Friday and it was a debate with other work over I think since they've been supporting us so I think it was really important that we as a council supported them in fact we were one of probably two or three councils that were representing other meetings in the time of war so if they know and can see that we're really keen to make sure we benefit from their input into what is <laughs> an important group in our but one of those they're called pat she's the lead member for commentary and they have already done exactly what we've done task the british group on staff recruitment and retention mm -hmm. it's obviously a hot and it is one of the hot topics that everybody raises when i, when I go to those meetings so I did send earlier a, their, their spoken paper that they shared with us. And indeed, the officers, uh, Phil and Steve and, and Mike, have already had this, and also um, some of the feedback they got as well. So I'm going to suggest that we use this scope of document to put together a terms of reference for the task of the few, which we then send out to members to approve before we have the next meeting. So when we come to the next meeting, we work between now and then to come forward with a, with a uh, terms of reference. And we ask those that want to attend. I've only got one person so far who says they want to be on it, and that's the owner. Uh, but we do need to be starting this asking for the group ideally before the next meeting in September. So I'm proposing that we get that opportunity, we opportunity, send it online, and read between now and then. And maybe call an informal public meeting as to go over this. And I'll just make a suggestion. Is no, sorry, I, I I did email Mike and say I, I wanted you to want to go as well. Okay, go. great. Um, I and, didn't see that. And, but... and also, um, Paul Rowan would like to be on it. Who? Paul Rowan. Oh, Paul. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and... Great. Thank you. So that's my proposal. Uh, we need to finish the meeting now. We can go all the end of our time. I don't think we constructively do anything on it today. Yeah. We have got, thanks to them, um, and I've said thank you, a spoken document for it. Uh, Gal was going to produce one, but then suddenly the off they came, so mm -hmm. it hasn't had a chance to. So we haven't got one to look at. I'm proposing that, as I say, that we work with officers to get one put together in the next two weeks. That's fine, thank you. Send it to committee members to look at, if you agree, then agree who could be going to be and a chair on it so we can start actually acting before the next meeting. Hopefully, would you ever be agreeable to that? Somebody propose that we do that? Yeah. Uh, Council Stone, second year Council Anson. All those in favour? Thank you very much. That's the best way to do with it.
Uh, the date of the next meeting is on the 26th of September, I believe. Oh, the 6th, through the 6th of September. Thank you for seeing you all then. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you for the great support. Thank you, Sam. Very quick comment, Chairman. I'd like to thank all the officers for the hard work they're doing at the moment. Those who gave the presentations this afternoon, but with all the pressures of our state, and we managed to have this meeting today. And I, you know, I think we need to realize the pressure people are under, the difficulties in morale at the moment. And I feel this on the members of this committee, we should be as supportive as possible. We've got to be critical friends as well, but I think we they need our support too. Thank you. 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 I'm going to confirm that the live recording has been turned off, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.